Describe your hotel experience in one word. Creative. International. Community. Intriguing. Opportunity. Exhilarating. Invaluable. How has the hotel school and the hospitality industry changed you? I definitely had mixed feelings about starting college from abroad in the middle of a pandemic. The members of the hotel school made difficulties such as socializing a lot easier by reaching out to me through coffee chats, redirecting me to other hoteliers and telling me about their experience. Members of the Hotel and Statler community deliberately reaching out to me and telling me about clubs and events that I wasn't even aware of prepared me in ways I wouldn't have been able to by myself. And for that, I'm so grateful. At first, I was really intimidated by my finance class last semester. However, as time progressed, due to the encouragement from my professor and classmates, I gained more and more confidence. Finance ended up becoming my favorite class, and I'm currently a teaching assistant, which I never could have predicted. This is one of the many ways in which the hotel school has helped me grow as a student and a person. As a transfer student entering Cornell during the pandemic, I knew my time here would be different, but I never doubted that I'd still be able to form relationships with professors and industry leaders from around the globe, and I have not been disappointed. I've spent hours on Zoom conversing with alumni whose positive insights and visions have inspired me to come out of this pandemic stronger than I was before. What I've learned from these industry leaders is that it's not about what happens to you, but how you overcome these happenings that makes you who you are. In an industry built on personal interactions, collaboration is essential in order to progress. This block of panelists will offer different perspectives covering the impact of COVID-19 on how professionals manage their teams while focusing on inclusivity and diversity. You will hear about the importance of roles such as human resources and chief diversity officer in encouraging development in the workplace, as well as a leadership perspective from powerful women in the industry. First up is managing people through change, rebuilding teams and trust, with our panelists who will share their HR perspective into managing people throughout the pandemic and where they believe the future of HR is headed. Well, hello everyone and thank you for joining our session today. We have two very um, exciting panelists here today to uh, share their knowledge and experience. Sarah and Robert, thank you so much for joining me with this panel discussion. And uh, perhaps I can ask you just to share a little bit about your roles with the core and uh, what you do in your day-to-day -day job, Sarah? Yes, so it's great to be here, Tracy. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you, Robert, as well. And uh, yes, as the COO of 21C Museum Hotels over the, the last uh, 12 months um, dealing with the pandemic, it's really been focused on handling operations, overseeing our team, and also then uh, communicating with our owners throughout this, this time. So it's been, a, it's been an interesting period, for sure. Thank you, Sarah. And Robert? Yeah, always great to uh, do a panel with two of my favorite people in a core and, and happy to contribute to the conversation on uh, the pandemic. We'll try and share uh, some insights from our uh, vantage point, uh, both in terms of a core and as I uh, give you a little bit of background on my, my role from the SBE side of the equation as well. So I serve as the head of talent and culture for a core in North America and the chief culture officer for SBE. Uh, globally, and we'll try and bring in uh, perspective from, from both sides uh, in the, un, under the Accor family umbrella. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. And gosh, I can't remember a year where I have um, lived through any more change than the last 12 months. Like, just, it really has been incredible. And um, Sarah, through the pandemic, there's been a lot of media coverage on how companies have managed their employees, both good and bad. I know that culture is really important to you at uh, the 21C brand. So share with us why you believe company culture is so important, particularly through a year that we've had and, and through the pandemic. 
Yeah, culture ultimately is the glue that that keeps us bound together, and it is um, it's what writes the ship. And I think having that as a foundation prior to the pandemic did make responding. To- the pandemic easier. Maybe that's not the right word for it. But when you rely on things that were important before and then continue to rely on those, maybe double down on that, that really is is key. And I think one of the elements of our culture that really played to the, the a lot of the challenges that were afforded us as part of the pandemic was this idea of celebrating mistakes and showing some vulnerability. Um, I joked with the team early on that during my time at, at Cornell, I do remember taking a wines class, but I don't recall taking pandemic. And uh, if it was offered, I opted out of it. And so we were going to make a lot of mistakes. We were hitting a lot of firsts, so massive hotel closings all in rapid succession. You know, obviously then massive layoffs and furloughing our our teams, communicating with owners, having owners that needed to put in a tremendous amount of cash in our businesses, all of these firsts. So when you do that and you have all of these challenges in front of you, you're not going to get it right. And I think accepting that and really almost giving everyone permission that it's not we're not going to get it right the first time. Um, We hope we do, but chances are we're probably not that we are okay with that and that we're going to pull together and pivot, which is my least favorite word from 2020, but we relied on it a lot. Uh, And and it really then, I think it gave everyone, like let the air out of the tire a little bit of like, okay, we're going to be able to do this, even though we've never done it before. And I think that was really key for us. Yeah. I love what you just said, your least favorite word, pivot. I can remember being on a call one day and hearing shift and pivot. And I thought, if I shift and pivot anymore, I'm going to be dizzy. (laughs) This is all I'm doing all day long, shifting and pivoting. Yeah, exactly. Robert, anything to add from your point of view as head of um, HR for SBE and and soon to be a core North and Central America? Yeah, no, I think for a great comment, Sarah. And I I thought about at some point during the year to change my title to the chief anxiety officer uh, in the spirit of those comments to help manage uh, speed of trust and transparency and reflecting uh, last night on the president's address. um, I think we have the same opportunity as a, as a government and um, as, as a people, as we come together to help rebuild uh, faith and confidence in um, whether it's a vaccine or how we're navigating uh, the current health crisis and instilling uh, confidence in uh, companies in business in hospitality and, and travel. And so I think, uh, Sarah, your comments, I think are reflective of that. And we're proud of uh, hopefully helping to lead the way uh, at a core. Thank you. And Robert, speaking of a core um, and um, leading the way, I know that they've done some really great things um, throughout the pandemic to really support their people. What are some of the most important things you you believe a course provided uh, to their employees throughout this pandemic? Yeah, guys, thanks, Tracy. I think there's there's so many things I'm really proud of Core uh, doing on behalf of our uh, teams. We refer to our uh, teammates as hardest in the organization, and, and that whole serve from your heart context has been at the core and foundation of our ecosystem and belief and, and values. And so, as we use that term today. Um, that's really a reference point, and it helps serve uh, with a higher calling and belief that ties us into some of the policies and practices uh, that, that formed how we navigate the pandemic together. And uh, a couple off the top of my head are the benefit coverage lines that we were able to extend to our, our teams. When we think about Maslow's theory of hierarchy of needs, food, water, and, and shelter, and health are really at the foundational core of being human. And uh, our, we found ourselves and our, our hardest in um, a precarious situation dealing with fundamental basic primitive needs and our ability as a company to step up and help contribute and provide uh, directed support in extending benefit lines uh, well beyond any legal requirements. Uh, I think was a leadership role within the hospitality space. We've had uh, programs that we call All Safe, uh, both to take care of uh, how we instill confidence from the consumer and the guest experience um, and providing uh, safety for our guests really starts with providing safety for each other. And so how we take those practices in making sure we're uh, uh, building in new and better uh, hygiene, PPE, uh, distancing practices, uh, cleaning procedures um, that help instill uh, safety and uh, health in the workplace are, are really important. And we've learned some things. Uh, you know, we, uh, who knew we needed to socially distance uh, when we break people around lunch in the employee cafeteria. And so we've had a uh, pivot 
as you say, and shift um, to some of our thinking and our practices. Uh, the notion of flexible work environments and uh, how we get comfortable with uh, technology has really become the norm. And we've had to challenge some people that had more traditional thinking in our company, like many other companies, and help um, build new memory muscle and skills around uh, technology enablement. And I think some of that is here to stay. We're experimenting that with on the, on the guest facing side with hybrid meetings. And we think there's a place for a continual flexible workplace with hybrid uh, technology. We've had hotels that have created food programs for our employees uh, and stories of managers who have given uh, furniture uh, out to uh, employees that are in need or laptops uh, to help enable their children to be able to navigate virtual environments in school. We've focused on mental health and mental well-being with workshops and strengthening programs we've had within the core that help people be their best. Um, and we do that within our leadership teams and functional teams by taking uh, sometimes meditation breaks and pauses and having a chance to uh, have walking meetings where not everything is attached to a computer and Zoom, uh, where people can find their harmony and their balance. Um, but there really are, uh, there's really one highlight of all of that uh, for me that's a standout, which was the development of our hardest fund. Um, and Accor took a position globally to raise millions of dollars. In North America, it was uh, north of $1.5 million on behalf of our hardest. And that helped to offset uh, some of these basic need uh, care cost issues of food, water, shelter, electricity. Um, and unfortunately, during the pandemic, funeral costs and things that um, were unexpected for uh, our teams. And so uh, we've made it really easy for them to apply and access and ultimately be on the receiving end of uh, meaningful um, economic contribution from the company. And it gives me great pride when we hear back from uh, the stories and the hardest that we've been able to, to, to touch and the families um, impacted. Thank you for sharing that. Just so heartwarming and inspiring stories about how Accor has really been able to reach out and help those most in need um, with their employee group. Uh, you spoke a little bit about some of the ways, touched briefly on some of the ways that, you know, we've kind of shifted into communication and Sarah, thinking about this last year, um, just how difficult it's really been to stay connected. What are some of the things that Accor has done to reach out to its employees during the pandemic? Yeah, well, I think uh, creativity goes back into uh, that a lot. That I, I love the fact that it, that normally if there are constraints around uh, something, an issue, uh, generally it is solved by some or spurs innovation. And Communicating with our team, I think, is always a challenge because you have a remote workforce. That is the foundation of how, how we're structured. But I think we really did uh, use the tools that we had in front of us just out of necessity. And that classic, like, necessity is the mother of invention that we created, uh, certainly regular Zoom meetings like many, many organizations did. Um, of, of having those as, as more routine than we would have normally had because you would have had just the, you know, seeing each other in the, by, the, by the coffee machine uh, in a break room, we, we were missing that element. And so we did the happy hours and all of those things within the, the corporate team. But from a property perspective, I saw just tremendous innovation from general managers and our talent and culture team where they were filming videos and posting those as fa on Facebook groups, creating Instagram channels. So there was really ongoing routine communication and what I've loved about that is those are not going to go away a little bit like what Robert was saying was that things that developed out of this, there are some great practices that we're not going to let go of. And we're going to look at this as the silver lining to a very challenging year. So even like our, it, at a 21C, we have a lonely penguin site um, that was an Instagram channel. Penguins are part of our, our um, art that we have permanent art at 21C. And uh, we had everything from promoting the hardest fund and making sure that people knew how to sign up to that and get access to that because that fund was really paramount for many, many people on our team. But in addition to that, putting up funny COVID memes, it was really just about staying engaged and, and meeting everybody at their at their point of need. So I think what's, what's really uh, heartening in all of that is that multiple channels will remain uh, even today after, mm -hmm. after people are back on property. Mm -hmm. Robert, anything um, you can add to maybe what SBE has done in that space in terms of staying connected, similar to what you know Sarah's shared? I would just give uh, Sarah a shout out at, at 21C because they have technology. One of the platforms is Meet Me's Box that they've used to um, facilitate that 
uh, mobile enabled uh, technology responsive uh, communication channels, which is really meeting people where they are. And, um, and you're able to provide uh, in a comfortable connected language that extends beyond the traditional you know, HRS and email system and platforms that also allow you to stay connected to communities uh, and potentially people that are on furlough or you want to recall and have come back to the organization. So um, I think it's just it, whether, whether it's that platform or any other platform, there are uh, vendor partners, beekeeper, workplace that are providing those mobile enabled technology solutions. And I think that's a part of our, our future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked about, uh, you know, how we've ad adapted and adjusted to our communications with our employees. But let's talk a little bit about um, how the pandemic has actually changed how we manage people. Sarah, anything you could share on that side? Sure. I mean, uh, uh, Robert alluded to it a little bit. Um, I, I think what is always challenging as leaders is knowing that your different members of your team really are coming from a different point of view with a different set of needs. And we had, prior to the pandemic, we had a bit more of a one-size-fits-all approach. And um, even things like flexible work hours or remote work that, that really was born out of necessity, I, th I think it is here to stay. And I think you're, we're ultimately going to end up with a happier workforce. Um, so I think when you don't apply a one size fits all, there is an element of risk in it, but the risk actually is, has a tremendous upside in that you are going to be able to address the needs of an individual. So how many people were managing uh, working at home when children were at home and trying to homeschool? And so, you know, we, because again, out of necessity, we got to break a bunch of rules and, and, and accept things that maybe a year ago somebody had proposed it, it would have been shot down in, in seconds um, because we would have said, no, you can't do that. Well, we didn't really have an option yeah. this year and we made it work. And so I, mean, I think it surprised probably a lot of us in that way. And as, as Robert also mentioned, you know, the idea of like virtual training and online platforms, that is certainly here to stay. That uh, the need really enhanced and sped up a lot of that uh, during the year because there, again, there was a necessity um, uh, for it. So this idea of flexibility, I think, is really key. Focusing on, on well-being, that flexibility does tie into that because if people have more flexibility, then if they need to, you know, take a break in the middle of the day because things were, it was a pressure cooker of a year and you could pop outside and take a walk around the block, you were going to be better for it. And most likely your team was going to be better for it if you were in a better, better headspace. And then just adapting to, um, you know, because we've had to adapt to this leaner operating model, I think everybody wearing a lot of different hats and, and uh, has been a challenge, except the benefit of that is that there's somebody else that can probably help you out because now people have been a little bit more cross-trained, whereas perhaps it was a little more siloed before. So again, I, I think ultimately our team's needs are going to be met in a, in a different way than maybe we would have had from a more traditional approach that, that was ingrained in us for years and years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Robert, anything to add on that? I, I would just echo that. I, you know, I think uh, we're in the memory making business. We, we sometimes use the phrase of turning moments into memories, and that's how we think about the organization and the hospitality industry at its at its core. And so, there are some lessons and practices in hospitality that I think can extend and apply to other businesses adjacent to and outside of of hospitality. And so. Uh, I think, as Sarah said, this regular uh, frequency of care and empathy and communication and taking the spirit of uh, servant leadership and service, um, I think it can apply to other businesses and lines of service. And I think you're seeing an evolution of that for uh, companies like Amazon and, and even some of the bigger uh, tech companies. Certainly, you're seeing that evolution in healthcare. I think hospitality has a, an opportunity to be infusive in um, leading uh, beyond just the hospitality industry. Thank you, Robert. So we've had a question come in, and Sarah, maybe I'll ask you if you could address it. The question's from Vicki. Thank you, Vicki. I think hospitality has a lot of lessons to teach businesses in terms of compassion and emotional intelligence towards employees. Any thoughts on how employers can take lessons from hospitality to uh, from hospitality and supporting employees through the pandemic? And I know Robert, you did address, sorry, Robert, you, you were sort of going down that path. And I think, Sarah, you, you probably can, you probably have some thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I agree exactly with what Robert was, was saying. And it, it really, I go back to a moment when our business, 
you know, a year ago was falling out, falling down around our ears. Mm -hmm. And I was so personally inspired by conversations that we were having with senior leaders across the organization, because where the conversation could have been really focused on the financial downfall that we were experiencing, the conversation that we spent the most time on in those early days was around setting up that hardest fund and talking about, and and I mean, we spent hours on that. And I remember stepping off the calls and thinking that is unique to our business, that that was where we were really putting the most focus. And on top of that, so not only taking care of our team, on top of it, every property was thinking of how they could help people in their community because of course it wasn't just, I mean, we, we were all in it together. I mean, there wasn't an industry, maybe save Amazon or Target um, or our grocery stores, every, although they had other challenges to tackle, um, that everybody was, was really being impacted by this. So we had chefs that were frantically trying to figure out ways that we could um, have, you know, be able to share the food that we had in our, in our kitchens and then bring more in to then share it with their, with their communities and it was nothing less than than really inspiring and it goes back to it makes me think of that em statler uh plaque that's in the hotel school the you know life is service and one who gives each other better service i can't remember exactly the rest of it but you all know the drill that that really that is if if we all take that approach and immediately when even when your world is collapsing immediately focus on those around you you are going to ultimately benefit and so i know that those actions that we took in those early days it does matter and um, I think it is really unique to this business, and I hope other businesses and industries are inspired by that as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you said something there about taking action early on things. So let's just take that thought and move it into another direction. And, Robert, I'm going to ask you uh, this question when thinking about some of the things Accor did early on and, and you know, in terms of protecting itself and have there been legal issues that really have uh, been brought to light due to COVID-19? And, um, and if so, how, how did you address them? Yeah, it's a great, great question, Tracy. And I think, uh, I think there are a series of legal, legal issues that come, uh, come top of mind. But I'll start with just a quick uh, acknowledgement. As I came into the hospitality business um, and I developed an appreciation for travel and the adjacency of some of our partners that are in the travel industry with us, and I was told early on that one of the most perishable things in the world is an airline seat. That once the door closes, you can't resell that airline seat. And the second is a hotel night, because once last night happened, you can't sell last night again. And so uh, it was this notion that hotels were just always open. You cut the ribbon and it, they, they never, ever, ever, ever close. And so it, it, um, I love that aspect of the business and this perpetuity and we always have to be on and it's 24 seven. Um, and so to have the legal notion of the Warren Act creep up on us and have to close hotels or shut down hotels and you know people had to dust off their you know HR uh, school books to say well, you know, what the heck is a Warren Act and what does it mean and what are the different state uh, jurisdictions and so our talent culture leaders and GMs um, had to think about expanding their appreciation for the law and the legal nature of the hotel business and there is the hotel business and there's the business of hotels and sometimes they're not the same and there are legal uh, implications for how the hotel organization is set up and management ownership structures and federal state regulatory uh, agencies that help govern aspects of our business but but the Warren Act and the ability to provide for uh, temporary closures in some cases longer term closures uh, was, was one consideration the family first uh, uh, coronavirus response act FFCRA was was a second one and you had federal uh, the federal government in the United States passing regulation and then states passing their own jurisdictional local uh, variations at times on, on elements of that law related to uh, paid time off and sick leave and how long you had to quarantine and taking care of uh, someone else who may have had uh, COVID-19. And also, by the way, if, here's what here's how that applies if you have kids that are in school and your need to accommodate. And so hopefully most companies like Accor developed a sensibility of let's just collectively try and figure out the right thing and work backwards so that the law becomes the lowest common denominator and our culture and our values inspire us to, to be better than uh, what's legally legally required. But but there are complexities of when, when we've had to have people take salary reductions or change jobs or do other things. There the Federal Labor uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, the FLSA, comes into play of uh, when you're making salary changes and considerations to people that are taking time off or say you know I don't I don't, I don't I'll save somebody else so uh, we'll we'll both go down to two and a half days a week and we'll both work. Okay, well 
you know, sounds good, but you know, how does that relate to the law and what's legally permissible and how we think about compensation practices and, and provide pay? How does that relate to unemployment eligibility um, and the totality of how people can you know, work collectively through the pandemic? Um, and then issues with our partners on the labor side. We have hotels that are covered under a collective bargaining agreement and uh, and and those and team members and partners that are that are not. And so we try and find ways to be uh, equal and have parity in programs. Um, and it's a little art and science to find a way to um, equalize fairness and uh, treatment and care uh, for the hardest in an organization and be responsive. So the the legal issues are are enormous, and I, and I think uh, you know, I worry if we're just getting started on the uh, legal complexity of what the pandemic will will unfold for us. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I see you nodding your head too, and you know acknowledging yeah. that thoughts. For sure. I mean, I think, Robert, you said it exactly right. If you start with doing the right thing, chances are you can then back into whatever the legal re requirement was. So that that um, certainly resonated with me. And I, I do wonder whether we are at the tip of the iceberg in terms of just some of the labor issues as a, you know, what what is 2021 going to bring as it relates to that in response to a lot of actions that were taken in 2020. So mm -hmm. um, to be to be determined. But I think we're yeah keeping an eye on that for sure. So Sarah, when thinking about, you know, um, Robert was talking about decisions that had to be made, how they were addressed in terms of decisions around furloughs, layoffs, warrant acts. But now that business is starting, we're starting to see it sort of come back to life a bit. Um, employees coming back to the workplace. What are you focusing on as employees return to work to ensure that uh, we're meeting those compliance needs to reduce liabilities to all of our stakeholders? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back a little bit to where we started the conversation with with culture is that the foundation and the tenets of, of, of that element, um, uh, the tenets of our business that were important before are just as important now. And that just like we would, would preach pr prior to this, it would be... Um, that if you take care of the team, then you'll take care of the guests. And when I think of a lot of the all safe protocols that, that Robert also alluded to that are quite strict um, that uh, and and well, well informed, um, really using CDC guidelines, uh, relying on a consultant from Johns Hopkins, like I really feel educated on the topic. And so that um, we share that then with the team and so that the team also feels educated like they really know the science behind the protocols and in addition to that giving them that it, I think what ends up happening is that if you give them those tools they are going to be comfortable and if they are comfortable and safe our guest is going to be totally taken care of and so it's no different than how we behaved before how we treat our team is how our guests are going to be treated and it and really this ties into it our health and safety of our team if we take care of that the guests are really going to are, are going to benefit from that to reinforce that I'm really pleased um, with a lot of the initiatives that Accor has put uh, to work, and some of that is on-site testing that is being rolled out for both our guests and uh, soon for our teams. Having um, hotels that have volunteered again, it goes back to that that very uh, service-driven focus that hospitality has. That we are happy to have our hotels be community vaccine sites. Um, you know, and as we've heard, that is ramping up. And so, if they need additional space, we've got the space. Uh, we we know that space isn't necessarily being used for groups so why not have it be used for vaccines to speed that process up so that feels really good because i think again it ties back to the community partner piece and then really again that education goes back beyond just the all safe protocols but the education on the importance of the vaccine providing flexible flex, flexibility if we need to help with transportation related to getting our teams vaccinated as soon as they're able to uh, i think it all plays into that if we take care of the needs of our team then the guests will follow and and uh, that really is a recipe for success great thank you we've had a question from the audience um, and i think this goes back um, a little bit, to Robert, to what you were talking about in terms of furloughs, but specifically, how has Accord dealt with furloughs, layoffs, and how have you helped severed employees? Yeah, a couple uh, reactions to that. One, I think in many cases it was the extension of benefits that was a primary concern and and taking care of healthcare needs. Uh, in in other um, examples where the closures were temporary, uh, as many people know, the gov federal government has stepped in with supplemental unemployment insurance, and some people were able to actually make even higher economic income on unemployment for a temporary period than they would have otherwise had in terms of displaced income supplemented in the U.S. with st uh, stimulus checks by the government or other, other means. Uh, but we have tried to uh, recall as many people back to the organization. We have the great fortune that 
Uh, very few of our hotels uh, remain uh, closed or have uh, closed with, with some uh, level of perpetuity at this point. Uh, and many remained open through the pandemic, in particular in the leisure market and resort uh, segments. And so our ability to transfer and shift and redeploy and, and provide hours um, has been a big piece of that uh, strategy toward recovery. In some such situations, we've had to provide severance uh, for people that were impacted on an exit or uh, impacted by uh, a job change through no fault um, of their own. And we welcome all those people back. Some people uh, made the terrible mistake of joining Amazon or healthcare or the grocery business or Target. And we want everybody back, come on home. I feel like a, a judge on The Voice. I should be welcoming people to Team Accor, uh, come come join us back. We, we miss you. Um, we're going to need a lot more people in this hospitality sector uh, as we rebuild and people have a real thirst to get together uh, for travel. And uh, there are great jobs, opportunities, and uh, we can't hire our teams back fast enough um, and welcome them back fast enough in many cases. And so uh, we're all hoping and rooting for uh, the right uh, basis of, of uh, responsible, safe uh, recovery uh, that I think is at the core of, and the heart of our business. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think a, another key decision that was tied to the hardest fund too was that for people that were on furlough or laid off or then ultimately separated, they still had access to that fund. And I, to me, that was, it was a way of us uh, being able to say yes, which we, we as, a, as a key tenant, a, a part of 21C's culture, of making that available to people even after they were not part of the team. And we just hit the $2 million mark for distribution. Um, I'm, I'm on that approval committee. I love those emails each week because it, it, it shows that we are continuing to provide support to, to people. And, um, and that's an organization, I mean, I feel proud to be part of an organization that is continuing to do that. We have a question from James. Um, what are you expecting in the industry this summer now that Biden announced everyone will be eligible for va vaccines in May? We'd like to take that one. I'm, I'm uh, happy to. Um, good. We're, we're, yeah. I, think we're, I think we're expecting to be. I, I think we're expecting to be busy. The the um, I, I I end kind of every meeting with our team of like what's keeping you awake at night because it tells me what the team is really focused on and my my what is keeping me awake at night piece is. It's a good problem to have. Uh, the fact that we're going to see a return. I think there are people are there's a pent up demand. People are eager to travel again, and uh, staffing uh, to to uh, tie back to what Robert said. People who have left the industry, um, the staffing piece is the is the piece that's that's keeping me awake. I think it's going to be really important um, that we get prepared so that we're not left flat on our feet, and uh, and that's really challenging right now. So, but I think it's coming back. So I feel very optimistic. Good. Thank you. And a question from Barbara, um, for new employees, do you ever partner with, oh, sorry, I just lost it. Do you ever partner with nonprofit hospitality training organizations? I know Accor has done great community work in Cambodia with Paul DeBrell School in, uh, uh, sorry, I keep losing that, in, uh, in Siem Reap. I'm not familiar with yeah. that, so I'm not sure I could comment. Um, yeah, yeah, we are. I, I, we are a global company. Um, most people in in North America would know a core from some of our legacy brands, Twenty One C, Fairmont, um, well, well well regarded, and uh, and hopefully people have uh, uh, been familiar with Sofitel and Novotel. Uh, but a core is one of the largest hospitality companies uh, in the world, and five percent of the portfolio is in North America, and ninety five percent is globally in other parts of the world, as evidenced by this question. So. Uh, we're doing great work uh, globally. We try and connect the dots uh, globally in terms of best practices and transferability of ideation and organizations, uh, many that span beyond the even the, the typical jurisdictions. And so we're actually doing some creative uh, work now on uh, sustainability uh, and our uh, movement around um, giving back to the earth and the environment, social responsibility work. Um, I'm incredibly proud of our work on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, globally as we build a better planet and a better world. Um, and there is a global tie-in. And so as we think about opportunities to work better together with any of these organizations, sometimes it's in the context of talent, sometimes it's in the context of being a better social responsible uh, organization and steward. Sometimes it's in the uh, context of just um, being a part of the broader conversation of hospitality and travel and trying to break down borders and help other companies think about vaccination and safe travel um, as we bring the world uh, closer. We think that's a big piece of uh, inclusivity in an organization is the more people travel 
and the more they under they create understanding and shared experiences, um, the the closer we get as a as a world. And so we really have an ambitious perspective that a core can help make a difference in the world we're in in dealing with some of these uh, broader topics of societal uh, change. And so when we have a chance to partner with any number of organizations, profit, nonprofit, um, doing great work, helping us access um, talent, if you have recommendations, please find Tracy, Sarah, and I and, and let us know because we, we're always on the receiving end of uh, partnerships that can help us get better together. Um, I, I do have a good example. First of all, hi, Barbara. Um, it's nice to see your name pop up. Um, and uh, we, there was one example of a, of a community organization in Cincinnati that helped really uh, teach culinary skills. And so we did work with that as a, um, as a group where we've continued to um, talk with them. Their name is escaping me, but they, they really were very, very hands-on and teaching people that did not have the prior skill prior, uh, you know, they didn't have any work experience and um, they were taught culinary skills that then we could pull into our, in our kitchens and in more junior roles. But that's been a, a good partnership, I think, to date. So that's one example. But I'm, I'm with, with you, Robert. Uh, Barbara, if there are some that you can think of, uh, yes, hopefully you know where to find us. Hey, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Robert. Another question from Jake. How are you thinking about getting the next generation of people and culture HR leaders engaged in a function that is ripe for major evolution? That's a great question. Um, well, I think that, that's uh, one of my stay awake items uh, before I go to bed tonight when I wake up in the morning is how to do it. Um, so if you have ideas, uh, please feel free to send us your CV and resume and come help us on the exploration of how we how we get better there. But I think it's uh, finding people that are wired around um, culture, ambition, uh, the desire to make a, a difference uh, well beyond uh, the talent and culture and HR function um, and helping to build a better organization, a better company, um, a better world, a better planet. And I think aspirationally, when we get people that are wired around a shared common core of beliefs, uh, that really, I think, makes us more uh, formidable as a competitor uh, because uh, we are adjacent to other lines of business. We're not simply a hotel company. We're a hospitality company. And we've launched lines of business around work from where we're thinking about how people work and how they socialize um, and other ways in which the hospitality industry will evolve. And I'm proud of Accor's ability to be on the forefront of that of that thinking. And the talent and culture people piece is an enormous contribution to the business. Um, I know our CEO uh, <laughs> would, would echo that in terms of, you know, if you asked her what her stay awake items are, it's how are we going to find the people that are building the business of tomorrow? Where are they today? How do we create it to be so compelling and so sticky that our culture is like glue? They can't imagine a better place to, to leave. And I'm really proud of our ability to have retained uh, the people or be able to attract the kind of quality of people that have been part of a core and we're just getting started so we got more more room on the bus as they say and uh the water's warm come on come on in we're, we're, we welcome uh talented uh, talented culture people leaders to, to join us on the on the mission great thanks robert well it looks like we only have about four minutes left and we're being asked um how uh, people can find us so uh perhaps we could just sort of quickly share as we wrap up here um, how anyone, uh, any of our audience and students can reach out to any one of us. So, Robert, I'll start with you. Well, I'm, I'm uh, shameless on LinkedIn. I take uh, almost all requests, so I feel like I'm a, uh, on the buy request side. So that, that's a great way to connect with me. Uh, we're all at the uh, first name, dot last name, at a core or uh, derivative uh, emails. I think um, Sarah's may have a, at 21C Museum. So uh, you can find us on email. Um, you can connect with us online. We're happy to be helped to be part of the conversation of hospitality and, and uh, really proud to partner with Cornell on this event. But Sarah, I'll let yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. LinkedIn is great. Um, I'm SR at 21chotels.com and uh, very accessible. Thank you. And similar to what Robert said, tracy.calamaris at accor.com and also very accessible on LinkedIn. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Robert, for your insight and uh, sharing your, uh, you know, your just your stories with us today and um, and with all of our students. I really appreciate it. I know you have busy lives and big jobs to do at a course. So thanks so much and um, have a great weekend, everyone, and rest of your day with uh, the conference. Thank you, Tracy, for moderating. Good job. Bye-bye. Yeah, Absolutely. Thank thanks so much, HEC.
Hi, my name is Jessica and I'm a sophomore at the hotel school and a programs manager in the programs department. I'm thrilled to be announcing Inspiring Women, Empowering a New Generation featuring Nala Holmes, Peggy Berg, Stephanie Rica, and Janice Parks. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the panel, Empowering Women, Inspiring a New Generation. My name is Stephanie Ricca. I'm the Editorial Director of Hotel News Now and today's moderator for our pre-recorded panel session. While we are pre-recorded, we encourage attendees to engage using the chat function that you see on your screen. I'd like to give a big welcome to our fantastic lineup of speakers today. I'm going to ask you each to introduce yourselves briefly before we get into, into our discussion points. And as part of your introduction, please share a little bit about your current role within the industry, of course, but also give us a brief sketch of your rise through the ranks, so to speak, in the hotel industry. Peggy, let's start with you. So I'm the chair of the board of the Castell Project, and we're a nonprofit organization working to advance diversity and leadership for our industry. And I came to this role, um, I have the uh, great good fortune to be a volunteer and I can do that because I've been a franchisee of Hilton and of Choice and having sold those hotels, I can do some things I never thought I'd be able to do. I also had a long career as a consultant, first as with uh, PKF, where I was the first woman employee elected to the partnership and then with my own firm called the Highland Group that is still doing well out there. So I'm delighted to be part of the industry and so appreciative to have this role now. Wonderful. Janice, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Janice Parks. I'm the Chief Human Resources Officer for First Hospitality. Uh, we are a management company that have been in the Chicago area for over 35 years, representing some of the most uh, notable brands uh, in the business. And interesting, I've been with First Hospitality a little over a year, about a year and a half now, uh, came into the role right before the pandemic and has had the opportunity of helping the organization through this time of change uh, within the country, right? And managing through talent plans and, and layoffs, uh, but most importantly, supporting us uh, as we continue to grow out of, of this pandemic era that we're in today. Prior to joining First Hospitality, I worked as an HR officer for McDonald's Corporation, also in Chicago. Great, and Nala, tell us your story. Thanks, Stephanie. I'm Nala Holmes. I'm vice president with Pyramid Hotel Group here in Boston. Uh, we're a third-party management company. We have about 120 hotels across the United States, Caribbean, Western Europe. I have been with the company for almost seven years now, and previous to that, I was with Rockbridge in Columbus, Ohio on their investment team. And I just want to say really quickly, as a fellow Cornellian, just so excited to be on HEC. I know the, like, the level of effort and intensity that goes from the students to put this panel together. So the fact that you're doing it virtually is just another great testament to all the students' passion and hard work for HEC. So thanks for having me. That's fantastic. And I think that that's a good transition. You know, I want to begin by acknowledging that our panel this morning is part of a larger discussion on today's conference agenda about how important it is to recognize that really it's people who drive business and help organizations succeed across all levels of the organization. You're all here today representing this idea of empowering women in the hotel business. And so I want to start by putting you on the spot a little bit. I'd love to hear each of your first impressions of what that phrase, empowering women in the hotel business, really means to you. And Nala, I'm going to have you uh, respond to this one first. Sure, I'm happy to. So I will just say that I feel that I'm still pretty early on in my career. So maybe I'll take a different spin on it and just say how I have been empowered. So I, um, I think it's been encouraging by those in my work environment and those outside my organization to really encourage me to be my authentic self. And so that's been a great, um, just 
a great way to sort of conduct myself professionally and personally. And so I think for me now, empowering women, um, because I've learned that, is really telling people, you know, ask for what you want to ask. You know, don't be afraid to ask. Raise your hand for those opportunities, big or small. Um, too often you hear the statistics, and I know Peggy will lead us through some of those, about women not taking a role because they don't feel qualified or not pursuing a promotion or a raise um, because they're nervous to, or they don't have the role model to do so. And I've been fortunate to have those role models in my career so far, and I've learned that you don't get what you don't ask for. Um, and now I've also had to learn that if I, the answer is no, then I have to not take that personally too. So those are just some of the early lessons I've learned in the last 10 years of being in the business so far. That's great. Janice, what's your first impression of what empowering women in the hotel business means? I really like this question, especially during the month of March as we celebrate uh, women throughout our history and the many contributions that they've made. And really when I think about empowering women and, and the message that I share with women in the workplace is using their voice, how to leverage their voice and using their voice and not being afraid to speak up for what matters um, in the workplace. Um, and using that as a tool, because sometimes we uh, are reluctant to say the things that are on our minds, um, yet when there are opportunities for growth, you know, we may not be looked upon for those opportunities and take those opportunities. Um, I also think empowering women means talking to other women, and, and whether that's in the industry or outside of the industry. Uh, know what's happening, um, know what makes a difference within your organization, um, and leverage those relationships that we already have as women um, to really help us thrive in the workplace, I think is very, very important. Fantastic. How about you, Peggy? What does that phrase mean to you? Well, I think we as women, and particularly young women, get these really strong messages from our media, from our families, from our professors, bless them sometimes from our bosses, that you have to choose between having a strong career and having a family, being a successful mom. And we do Castell at college, reach out with panels of executive women to talk to college students because that is absolutely the backwards untruth of, of this time. The fact is, that when you have a really strong career, you have a lot of resources. And when you have a lot of resources and you're in a place in your career where you can control your time, you have so much more that you can do for your family and with your family. And when you've become a leader in your business, you have a set of skills that you can bring to parenting that is unmatched. So to me, empowering women is getting over that whole you have to choose thing and saying, think about resources, think about careers, think about really what you wanna bring with your family, what you wanna do with your family and figure out how to do it. It may not all happen between three and five on Thursday, but it can happen. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that those tools and that voice is there for women as well as everybody else. You know, today more than ever, I think we are learning and talking more and more about how important representation is. And Peggy, I wanna keep it with you for a second because we know the Castell Project compiles annual research on female representation in particular in the hotel industry. I would love for you to take a few minutes to summarize three or four key takeaways from the research, particularly knowing what we know now about how this pandemic has effectively resulted in a lot of impact on women in the industry in particular. Give us some takeaways from the research that, that we need to know right now. We, we put out three annual reports and the 2021 versions will be coming along in the next month or so. The, uh, and the reports are a free download on our website, www.castellproject.org. So let me start with this one. 84% of hotel companies have no black executives on their websites. So knowing the stats, I'm pretty sure they have a strong roster of black employees. And those are people on a corporate ladder with broken rungs. The odds of a black person reaching VP are one to 60. And for black women, it's almost double that. 
On the other side, the largest firms in terms of assets and revenues have the most diverse boards. And that's true both in hospitality and across all industries. Those highly successful firms are not coincidentally also the firms that have the best developed cultures for showing opportunity to their entire diverse talent pool. They're pulling from a talent pool that's more than twice as big as companies that aren't pulling from a diverse talent pool. One more thought, there was a 20% increase in women CEOs from 2018 to 2019, but still only 12% of our industry leadership was female. So I want you to think about that collection of statistics. And then think about this. We are right now going through the most massive corporate reorganization of our careers and possibly of a couple of lifetimes. So companies that use this opportunity to align their leadership with their talent pool and their marketplace, those are the companies you want to work for. Those are the companies you want to invest in. Those are the companies that are going to be the winners in our industry. I think that phrase, companies that use this opportunity, really stands out mm -hmm. to me. And I see nodding heads, and I know the audience watching this, I'm sure, is nodding as well. Achieving that more equal representation and the benefits that it brings, we see the numbers. We know that to get there requires often something else entirely. It requires a lot of advocacy and support. Janice and Nala, I'd like to hear from you both about times in your careers when you've been an advocate and times when you've been the beneficiary of advocacy, you know, or even on the flip side, do you recall times when you really could have used that type of support and maybe didn't get it? Nala, I'll start with you on this one. Sure. Thanks, Stephanie. So I would I'm going to lean into your question about being the beneficiary of advocacy. So going back to sort of being earlier, earlier on in my career, I would really say my personal and professional development has been consistently supported by advocates. Um, I think without my advocates, both within my organization, even outside my organization, my posse, if you will, I would not be where I am today. So I think having spent so much in my earlier career with Pyramid, um, I've grown with the organization. And with that, the types of advocates they have and what they're advocating for on my behalf have, has really changed over the years from, I would say from smaller project to, projects to larger responsibilities. Um, you know, whether it's seeking financial backing to attend the Castell project, which I was fortunate to do in 2017, or going to HNLA's forward conference or pursuing opportunities sometimes that I have no business in, um, you know, whether it's public relations or marketing, something I'm really not qualified for. Um, I've had advocates at all levels really push me um, and supported me in pursuing some of those opportunities. So I think in my experience, the advocates that have been most effective um, on my behalf and similarly those I find myself advocating for are the ones I have the closest relationships with on both a personal and professional level. And those are relationships that don't form overnight. They really are months and years in the making. And those are like I used this word earlier, but they're the ones that are the most authentic. And so I think because of that, it makes it a lot easier of a conversation to have with whomever it is in terms of the audience to say, I'd like to support so-and-so, or I would like Nala to do this because they know me so well. They know, um, they know my strengths, they know my weaknesses, they know the opportunities I'd like to pursue. Um, I think advocacy uh, was really put into perspective for me in 2020. Um, you know, when Pyramid, like many others in the hospitality industry, had to make some difficult decisions as it relates to furloughs and layoffs in the organization. So I'm confident that because of the advocates in my organization, I was spared for, for many furloughs and was, in fact, asked to participate and lead teams of, again, things that I probably had no business in relative to legislative affairs, certain owner relations to help them through the pandemic. Um, again, those just go back to the deep relationships and having those advocates in my organization. And I think um, you know, again, having a history of advocating for myself, raising my hands for those opportunities, not being afraid to spearhead certain initiatives, combined with being looked at as someone um, who wants to learn new things and can be relied on to follow through. I think those made me um, someone worth advocating for, and that helped me in many ways. And certainly 2020 was, um, you know, no different. 
That's a great way to couch it, that person worth advocating for and building relationships. Janice, give us your perspective on how that role of advocacy, whether for yourself, others for you, you advocating for others has played out in your career so far, especially in the line of work that you're in, in HR, that's got to play a big role. It does play a huge role uh, in HR, being in front of the advocacy and giving it back to others or or being supported myself through the role of, of advocacy. Very early in my career, I had an opportunity to hear Carla Harris, she's the author of Expect to Win. And I had a chance to hear her speak uh, at a company event. And what she said that day has really stuck with me throughout my entire career. Um, and what she said is, was in order to be successful in your career, uh, if you wanted to move up, you had to have somebody there to advocate for you. And I think she used the term sponsor you. Um, specifically, an individual uh, must be someone who can walk into a room uh, where decisions are being made uh, and advocate on your behalf a decision maker, so to speak. And when I was young, coming up through an organization, a very large organization, it was very important for me to hear that message. So I like to share that with, with, with folks who look to my role or my peers' roles um, as potential advocates for them as well. Um, think about this as well. From an HR perspective, there is not one evaluative process, whether it's academia, uh, in the industry of hospitality or any professional role that doesn't have a human element attached to it that measures for some level of subjectivity. Uh, and with that, you need someone who can speak on your behalf uh, and advocate that can help influence others of why you should be considered for a role or why you should be considered uh, for a school project or why you should be considered for a business need of somehow. Um, and think about it as well. And when I'm advocating or I'm speaking to employees about advocacy and the importance, what I share with them is just keep two things in mind. One, your performance and two, the relationship. Because if you're performing at a high level, advocates will come to you. They will want to support you and lead you. Uh, but let's say you're not in a position where others get to see your performance. And so as an employee, I want employees to learn how to develop relationships. Uh, and that's very important that you're speaking to people uh, and sharing your own story about how you're supporting an organization, a project, or any kind of goal that you're trying to achieve because the relationship itself can help build advocacy and wanting somebody or having that individual want to support you uh, in a role especially in the workplace, uh, we're not always in the room when decisions are being made about us. And think about this, who's in the room and who's going to advocate on your behalf? And the work is on us uh, as employees to make sure that we've aligned in a way that we have the support that we need. I really like that. You know, again, it, it echoes that theme of having the skills, having the ability, being able to talk about it and have other people recognize it. I'd love to hear from um, any of you really expanding on this topic of, we hear a lot about advocating for ourselves and building that persona. Do you all see higher levels in organizations kind of opening their eyes to being able to see this whole person? Um, has that changed over recent years or, you know, is, is there still that idea that, oh, the CEOs and the people in the C-suite just kind of look at how people look on paper? Have you, have any of you seen any evolution of that kind of thinking? Peggy, have you seen that? I have been so impressed about that. It's been one of the great joys of doing the Castell Project. So everyone that comes to our Castell program, our leadership development program for women, has a champion, someone in their organization that nominates them and actually writes a recommendation for them. And so I've had this opportunity to, to talk to the senior leaders in the organization and they know their people. I mean, they'll call me up and say, I'm gonna send so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so, and this is why, and this is what they need. And they're gonna do great in this company, but in order to get to the next step, they need this strength. And, and you, you know, I mean, it's, remarkable how much attention they pay to their human talent. I, 
it's been great, really just really insightful. And that they've been brave enough to say, here's a woman she needs to learn to stand up for herself, for instance. You know, that's kind of a risk for a man to get on the phone with me and say that. And they, they do in order to help their female employees reach their potential. It's, it's extraordinary. That's a, that's a positive, especially now. Sometimes you think when business might be a little shaky, it can be tough to rock the boat or to ask for it. Mm-hmm. So it's nice yeah. to see that there is some acknowledgement of that. And I do, I will, I do sense a, a certain level of, of responsibility as a, as a female on an executive team and encouraging my peers um, to engage and how to engage with female leaders. When we're 12% of the industry, you're going to see very few in management roles. One of the things that we've done is, and, and um, Peggy mentions this, we, we've asked our leaders to champion some of the things and the projects that we are doing. And many of those uh, we are putting women in front of. And I think that's very important. And, you know, the guys sometimes uh, may be new to this, and but it's amazing how engaged and how quickly they become engaged, it just becomes second nature. And um, I think that's important. It's great for women to see that they're being supported by male leaders in the organization. And it's and it works both ways. It works for the male leaders to get to know the female uh, leaders who want to grow in the organization a little bit better too. I wanted so, to add something. I know we have students on, on this program also. And it took me years to figure out that the whole relationship with advocates is actually a two-way street. That when someone advocates for me and and I find out about it, or if I somebody I want to be an advocate for me, even as an employee three or four levels down the ladder, I also have the opportunity to advocate for them. I can talk about how they're supporting people's growth in the company. I can talk about how they're people that represent opportunity. I can talk about what they're doing and for them to have that kind of recognition from team members is not, not a small thing. It has, it has some value. So, and conversely, for people who are careless about how they speak about people who advocate for them, it costs. So you want to you want to take advantage of that strength that you have to be an advocate up as well as an advocate down. That Encourage concept your of advocates, a, right? That concept of a two-way street is really interesting. And okay. I think along those lines, I'd love to talk a little bit more about the responsibilities that both companies and individuals have to do what it sounds like you're saying to really walk the talk when it comes to that representation for whatever it may be, gender, race, you know, uh, suitability for a position. Nala, I'd love to hear from you on this one. You know, since you've graduated, Cornell, you've been rising through the ranks. Um, How important throughout your career has this idea of company accountability or seeing your employers walk the talk when it comes to representation and diversity then? How, How do you approach it? How have you approached it throughout your career when you're looking to take new roles? Yeah, great question, Stephanie. So I've been fortunate at Pyramid to grow with the organization. And like I said before, I've had a tremendous amount of support along the way from both female and male mentors. I think at Pyramid, um, just from the corporate office, you know, women are represented in areas typically dominated by women in our industry, such as human resources, legal and accounting. Um, I'm the only female on my team. Now, part of it is perception, right? So I think, um, Again, going back to what people have encouraged me to do, which is to be my authentic self, to ask questions, to raise my hand for certain things. Because of that environment, I may have a sort of slightly different view on representation and diversity because I'm really looking at diversity of thought, which I feel like is very well represented on my team, despite the gender, perhaps despite the fact that I'm the only female on the team. Um, I think, you know, Pyramid, we still have a long way to go in terms of diversity inclusion from a from optics perspective. Um, but, you know, so long as there's diversity of thought, I think I'm really appreciative of that. And I think 
I wish there were more female candidates that we could look at to hire for the positions that we're hiring for. And the way I can help with that effort, and this goes to your question of how do I address it within my role and from my view, is I can help with that effort by casting a wider net, right? So because I'm involved with Castell Project, because I'm involved with Cornell, because I'm involved with XYZ Networks, maybe because I'm a woman, I may have access to different networks, different candidates, different people and groups. Um, so making sure I do that and bringing those backgrounds and perspectives into the hiring pool or even into a conversation of, you know, maybe we should talk to these people about an idea we have in our organization. It may not be for a position, but it may be something through my network that I can provide, again, diversity of thought and potentially a different race, a different gender as well to bring into the mix. Opening the pool, casting a wider net. I love that. And Janice, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that too, because obviously HR is where so much of these policies and practices start. How do you see this changing when it comes to casting a wider net or finding diversity of thought, race, gender, all of the above as you're looking for positions or looking mm -hmm. to change a company within the organization? Absolutely. Well, one, I'm very thankful to work for an organization that believes and embraces uh, diversity and inclusion. So that's a very, that's a first start, and and not just on paper. And and what I mean by that is, you know, putting our words to action. Um, we are looking at first hospitality. How do we cast that wider net uh, within the organization? And that starts with getting to know our people better and understanding uh, what does the road to success look like for them, right? And if we don't ask the question to Nala, what do you want to be in this organization? What other things interest you? Then we can't help get her there. And so that's the number one step is really broadening the communication uh, and conversations uh, back and forth between uh, the leaders and the associates. Uh, we're in the middle of a, a newly designed performance management system where it is employee led and the employees get to share how they're feeling in their role and what support they may need um, from their managers. Uh, and then when they come together with their managers, it's a conversation versus this written form of, of documentation of what you've performed in the past, forcing us to have a conversation about the future instead. And that's really, really important. Um, we're also looking at ways to how do we engage uh, not only with the community, um, but with other organizations or colleges uh, such as Cornell to say who is interested in this industry and how do we give them an opportunity to come see what it's like firsthand. Um, we've all done probably internships or apprenticeships opportunities. Uh, we really want to work harder and deliberately about engaging in diverse communities and providing those opportunities uh, to reach some of the groups that we've not been able to reach in the past. Um, I like where we're going, not just as an organization, but I think as an industry, uh, why eyes wide open. Um, I think we have a lot to learn from the Nala's of the world to tell us and help guide us. Uh, perspective on things is going to be different than mine. I've been doing HR for 20 years, so I, I look forward to hearing new ideas and new ways of engaging and embracing this new generation. Uh, and really looking forward to the changes that we're going to be able to make at First Hospitality. Janice, do you think that in recent years, or maybe yes or maybe no, that people coming into the company or interested or people that you're talking to out at college job fairs or as you're interviewing, are they more interested in learning how your company is accountable? Do they ask those questions? I feel like those were questions I never would have asked at the beginning of my early job interviews, but now I would I would want to know, again, that two-way street, what the company does. It is those. so, it, it, there has been a change in how people perceive those, those job opportunities. And I think as uh, the students who are listening today, I am sure when they're in front of somebody like me, an HR officer, they're going to ask, you know, what are your values as a company? Who do you, what do you stand for? What does the diversity and the makeup of your organization look like? How many women leaders uh, are on your board of directors or board of advisors? Um, and how many women leaders work in the organization? Um, I had someone ask me not that long ago, how long does it take uh, for women to get promoted? Uh, within your organization. So absolutely. Uh, I find those questions inviting. It's an opportunity to see the changes that we're currently going through uh, and what people expect 
Um, women recognize the opportunities that they have and that, you know, they don't have to say yes to everything. They want to be in a place that makes them feel uh, whole as a human being in terms of their values and their beliefs. That's got to become more and more important as we emerge from pandemic and can potentially get back to hiring levels that are that are more commensurate with what demand will look like in the industry. And Absolutely. And, and, you know, Stephanie, when you think about how, you know, we compete with with the media, so to speak, social media, um, if you want to find out about somebody, <laughs> you Google them, right? Or you go to their Instagram or their Twitter account. Um, and so it, it's very interesting. It's a, it's a new day and a new time. And uh, individuals will hold companies accountable very differently than they have in the past. That two-way street again. And you know, you mentioned, we've talked a couple times, we've mentioned a couple times this work-life balance and, and finding accountability. In the past, that notion of work-life life balance has always been a topic on these panels for women in the industry because of that idea that women were always the ones who had to worry more about the non-work parts of life. Uh, and I think, of course, we've learned since this pandemic that really nobody can keep everything truly in balance. And when we had a conversation prior to our panel, Peggy brought up this topic of this concept of work-life symphony instead of work-life balance. Peggy, tell us more, tell the audience more about what that means, because I know that we all found that very compelling. So when you're striving for balance, you're really trying to be static because anytime anything changes, you're out of balance. So if you want to live a life that you're growing, your kids are growing, things are changing in your, in your company, you're going to be out of balance all the time. So let's not pretend that we're going to stay in balance. Let's think about how we blend all the parts of our lives. There's our our family, there's our work, there's our social and civic commitments, and there's ourselves. And it's not all going to happen all in the same Thursday from two to four, but we're all going to blend all those, all those things over our lifetime. So how does your symphony run with the you know, not the woodwinds, but in the percussion, but with these elements of self and work and social and, and family, how do you put that together over your life? And it's such a rich opportunity to think about how you can make the most of all of it instead of trying to harness it back into something that will always be falling out of balance. Let's, let's have a symphony. Let's enjoy it. Sometimes there's a lot of percussion. Nala, how does that <laughs> ring to you? Does that make sense to you? It does. It does. Absolutely. I think at the end of the day, particularly with the pandemic, our work, life, everything in between, it's like in this little square, right? Um, but, you know, previous to the pandemic, um, the leadership at Pyramid has been really laser focused on this concept of how do we work smarter, not harder. And so we've actually been making a lot of strides to improve our platforms, the tools to make sure people can have the space to think, have the space to take a holiday, have the space to, you know, feel more fulfilled. And in turn, they'll be more productive at work. So for me, it's all about dedicating a certain part, part of my day, whether it's to go take a walk, go for a run, make a meal, read a book. There has to be something where you decompress because otherwise I feel like if you're continuously thinking about work, at some level, you're just going to cap out and it's just not going to be productive for yourself mentally or even for, you know, your work counterparts. So it really is about making that symphony work. And I really loved your joke, Stephanie, about percussion, because I feel like 2020 was a lot of noise and now we're just fine tuning the strings so we can get the symphony to sound better again this year. <laughs> Janice, I see you nodding too. Does that concept of a symphony all working together as opposed to a potentially out of balance Oh, absolutely. Uh, Peggy knows I love that phrase. <laughs> um, you know, and it's important to, to hear that, right? Um, because that question is mostly asked um, toward women, I think, as you mentioned. And organizations right now, we're all, we've all adapted to the work from home. 
concept to some degree. I like what Nala says because I know in our organization, it's important that we stress the importance of wellness and, and self-wellness and taking care of you. Uh, you lose track of time when you're working at home. And so it's important that um, we do take the time out to take care of ourselves um, and so that we can take care of our loved ones and then return, we can show up with energized uh, to do the work that's in front of us every day. I think it's important to hear messages like that coming from women such as yourselves who are very high up in your organizations because that type of, of message filters down. And uh, I think that's important. Now I'd like to close today um, by asking each of you to share one piece of advice specifically tailored to students in the audience today. I know we've got an audience that's very diverse um, around the world representing people from all levels of their career. But I think that tailoring this piece of advice to students can be telling not only for them, but for uh, those potential hiring managers in the future of those students. So think about, you know, people who are entering or close to entering the industry in a time that's characterized by a lot of low lows related to the pandemic, but also some very necessary and refreshing heightened awareness around diversity and representation. Think of it as a note to your college age self. Peggy, what's your advice? Oh, we'll let Peggy come off of mute and there we'll, we oh, there she is. Um, okay, Peggy, what's um, your advice? My advice is to stretch. People have been asking me, what's the best and worst thing that, that's happened in your career? And to me, they, they always are exactly the same thing. There's when I say I'm going to try something new and stretch, that's great. And when I've done it and I feel really good about it, that's great. And the middle part where I'm actually doing that stretch, it's awful. It's absolutely <laughs> awful, but stretch, it's what makes your career worthwhile. That's wonderful. Nala, how about yours? I love Peggy. So mine was sort of similar, but, um, you know, 2020 has been really interesting for me. It's really been my first downturn as a professional. So I graduated in 2012. So I've been on this uptick that everyone's been talking about that's had to come down and it certainly came down in a hurry last year. So I think, again, I go back to what I said earlier, don't be afraid to ask. And that's similarly to stretching, you know, don't be afraid to ask to do something that you're not qualified for, you know, lean into your transferable skills. 2020 has taught me nothing, but, you know, you can do things that you didn't think were possible. They weren't in your toolkit, but now they are. And I'm sure every other organization, people have found ways to contribute in ways that they hadn't in the past out of their scope of work. So to the extent that you can, you know, lean into those transferable skills, don't be afraid to ask. And I think the other thing um, that Janice said, <clears throat> excuse me, it sounded like people are asking about things that are important to them. So what, what are your values of the company? I think that's really, really great. So again, it goes back to don't be afraid to ask, whether it's for an opportunity, whether it's about your values, whether it's about skills that you didn't think you had, but you think you have something transferable. I think those are great things to keep in mind. Fantastic. So stretch, lean into transferable skills. Janice, what's your piece of advice? Nala so nicely segued to me, and it's really, um, I, I was thinking about my, my young self coming out of college um, and believing that I needed to work within this, within this box of what was prescribed for me. Um, I wrote down, thinking about this question, um, not letting anyone define who you are. Uh, Nala talked earlier about being your authentic self. And that's really important. When you go work for an organization, there's a lot of investment that they make in bringing you on board, as well as you make in wanting to work for that organization. And don't you want to be where somebody's going to accept you for who you are? So understand your value. You know, don't get buried into a box because it's been prescribed that way, but have the right conversations. Make sure, you know, we talked, talked about uh, advocates and sponsors, but Make sure there's somebody that's mentoring you, whether that's in your organization or outside, if it's a teacher, um, a neighbor who may, be ha may have a career that you're interested in, um, listen and, and, and accept those advices and those skills along the way. But show up, be yourself, and, and don't get boxed in because somebody has prescribed what they think you should do. 
I think that's fantastic and, and very illuminating for all levels of an organization within the industry who's listening today. That's a great note to end on. I'd like to close by asking all of you in the audience to join me in thanking Peggy Janice and Nala. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference.
my name is Kimberly Liu. I'm a freshman in the hotel school, and I'm a programs manager on the programs team. I'm so thrilled to be introducing the rise of the chief diversity officer, featuring Ash Hansen, Felicity Hassan, and Jyoti Chopra. Enjoy! Hello everyone and thank you very much to the Hotel Ezra Cornell for hosting us today. My name is Felicity Hassan. I am the managing director of a executive search firm called Ordelis. Ordelis looks to level the playing field for diverse talent. We're extremely passionate about the concept of widening the gate rather than lowering the bar for diversity. I'm incredibly honored to be joined by Jyoti Chopra and Ash Hansen today to discuss the rise of the Chief Diversity Officer. Um, so the Chief Diversity Officer role has emerged as a critical resource for strategic development of corporate culture over the course of several years, but none more dramatically than last year, where we really saw incredible tailwinds provided by the challenging circumstances that we were facing through the COVID-19 epidemic and of course the amazing energy uh, that was that was brought about by the Black Lives Matter movement in the summer. So with that I think we've seen a dramatic shift in the importance um, of, of the Chief Diversity Officer role and that's really where we're, we're going to focus our energies today. So I want to kick off with a little bit of an introduction. So I'd love for you, Jyoti and Ash, to introduce yourselves, get a little, give us a little bit of an oversight of how you got into this space and what does this role mean for you personally? So Jyoti, do you want to get us started? Sure. And uh, hello, everyone. It's fantastic to be with all of you. And thank you to the Hotel Ezra Cornell for hosting us on this really important topic. Um, uh, I got into this role actually at the onset of my career, which actually began in the public sector at the United Nations. I spent a number of years at UNICEF, which was the UN agency that focused on issues affecting women, girls, and young children. And I was there at the time of the Bosnian War in the 90s and then the Rwandan genocide and really had firsthand a visceral um, view and lens of the inequalities um, uh, around the world, and uh, particularly issues affecting women and girls. And that's really where my early roots in diversity uh, were grounded, and uh, it stayed with me ever since. Uh, I moved into the private sector and ended up on Wall Street. And uh, my segue into uh, the diversity officer role began in multicultural marketing and looking at diverse customer segments and how do you uh, grow business from diverse customer segments. So I had sort of very much a, an early commercial orientation. I've been a chief diversity officer since 2012 at Bank of New York Mellon Pearson and currently uh, uh, serving in a broader capacity but overseeing diversity and inclusion for MGM Resorts International. Uh, my view is there's never been a more important time than now for a chief diversity officer. And the reason for that is um, certainly on, on one level, due to the heightened public advocacy, the social movements that have arisen in the last several years. The second is because of the rise of regulation and legislation. So if you look at, for example, in the UK, the onset of mandatory gender pay gap reporting for companies that have more than 250 employees um, necessitates a need for somebody in an organization to be looking at um, diversity. And I think the third and most important has been the rise of environmental, social, and governance factors known as ESG. And that has really elevated the significance of the chief diversity officer role at the C-suite level and at the boardroom levels. So that's my take on the role. Thank you so much. Um, I think I think you you raised some incredible points there, and it's always it's always really nice to hear like the personal story of like how you were kind of got excited about this initially from the time at the UN. Thank you so much, Ash. 
Yeah, so um, it's interesting. My, my sort of start in this work is a little uh, bit more personal. You know, I grew up in India, um, and I was recruited to a role in Malaysia early on in my career and then made my way to the U.S. as part of a starting, um, so the startup team for the U.S. operations of an IT consulting firm, very much on the business development side of the house. And, you know, a lot of what happened for me career-wise was startling in the sense that, you know, when I graduated with a degree in literature, I didn't expect to be doing what I do today. And it happened because people saw potential in me, offered up opportunities for me, opened up doors to me. I was, you know, the youngest person on the business development team. I was the youngest female manager in the company at a different point, you know. And and so part of what has informed most of my thinking about this has been my own personal experience of what it's like to be a woman or a young person or someone who looks different from everyone else in the room or has a different perspective or vantage point. Um, and that's a lot of what drives my passion around this work. Um, and, you know, I, I, I had the chief diversity officer role for the for Airmark. I'm with Airmark. Um, and I had the chief diversity officer role for the organization, I want to say, six years ago. Um, and I moved into the head of HR role for all of North America for the company and returned to the function actually in July of last year, based very much, Felicity, on, on the point that you're making around, you know, this renewed sort of vigor around this conversation. Um, and much like how, what Jyoti explained, I've come into this role with oversight for the broader ESG platform for the company, not just diversity. And it's so important to you know, take diversity out of where it sits in a silo within an organization to really bring it center stage and make it um, make it sort of integral to multiple ways in which the organization affects the environment it lives in, right? Both in terms of communities, in terms of actual environmental impact, in terms of social impact. When you think about the broad um, ways in which an organization inter, inter in, you know interacts with its environment. I think looking at diversity as a cornerstone in all of those areas is a is a new and, and improved way to think about diversity and inclusion. So, so I'm really excited to do what I do today. Felicity, if, uh, if, if I can just build on um, um, sort of Asha's story and how she she evolved into the role, you know, there, there is no formal sort of academic um credentialing, if you will, or degree in how to be a chief diversity officer. There are certifications. In fact, Cornell actually has um, a pretty robust certification. So that there are courses you can take. There's thoughtware um, and so on. But, but a lot of our peers uh, grew up in very different um, domains. I've seen a lot of lawyers become chief diversity officers. Uh, I have seen um, colleagues out of the human uh, resources, human capital practice become chief diversity officers. But I've also seen business leaders evolve into the role and, and people from very diverse backgrounds. My own undergraduate degree was in journalism yeah. and uh, I have a background in communications. And I, as, for those of you who may be contemplating it as a career path, you know, I think what, what's important is being an enterprise wide sort of leader um, being able to understand strategy, being able to uh, influence and to mobilize support. Mm -hmm. um, and often you have to make a business case, uh, being um, uh, pretty savvy in and around data and some analytics. I, I, I think those are sort of the core competencies that you need. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's an incredible role. It's probably one of the toughest roles. Um, but it, uh, I've never looked back, uh, and uh, I think it's uh, in many ways probably one of the most personally satisfying and meaningful roles you could have in a career. I think that's a great point. And, you know, the one thing which I think we've really noticed is the elevation of the chief diversity officer role, which I think also really speaks to your point, Ash, around like going into that head of HR role for North America and then coming back into the chief diversity officer position because the chief diversity officer role is so critical now and is being kind of counted on to really sort of shift the dynamics and the representation and the culture of an organization. So I would love to, to hear a little bit more about about how both of your roles have evolved and expanded to take on like different responsibilities such as the ESG and the CSR space and so on and so forth and kind of breaking that down a little bit more so that we can understand like the true breadth of it. 
and also like where you see that going over the next couple of years. Ash, do you want to expand on that? Sure. Um, yeah. So it's, so it's interesting, right? Because it, it's exactly what happened at Airmark. We took what was quintessentially sort of the old CDO role um, and we've evolved it into the role that it is today, which brings together um, diversity, equity and inclusion, um, you know, sustainability and community relations and philanthropy. And what's interesting about all of that is if you think about it, the same threads are woven throughout those three areas, right? So traditionally those three things sat in different pockets. DEI sat with human resources, um, sustainability sat with our CFO and um, uh, you know, our community relations and philanthropy sat under com our community um, or our communications team. And what we lost in the fact that those were separate silos was the connectivity between those three in the sense that if you think about if you think about disparate impact on black and brown communities as an example, you will see a thread that's woven through in terms of what you do from a DEI point of view to what you do from a sustainability point of view, because we know that environmental practices, poor environmental practices actually have greater impact on black and brown communities also. And then you tie it down into community where, you know, when you're supporting community organizations, if you have a strategy that's solidly tied into your DEI principles and your sustainability principles, you can go much further with what an organization can do with philanthropy and community relations. And so to us, the power has been bringing those three things together. And to your point, Felicity, about elevating the conversation. I mean, you know, we're now talking to the board every quarter about ESG more holistically and specifically around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have quarterly board conversations as well. And so, you know, in my prior role in the CDO, I certainly, you know, presented to the board on the topic. But now it's very different from presenting to the board. Now the board is participating in the conversation and participating in setting um, setting the horizon for the organization in terms of how progressive we want to be and how much we want this to be a competitive difference for us as a company. And so the conversation is entirely different than it used to be. And I think that is what's exciting about the work right now. And I think, I mean, my, my bet would be that you know, I, I would say Jyoti's jo job and mine are probably still a little bit of an anomaly in this field. I think very often CDO roles are more purely CDO roles, and you know, human capital is a big focus, and perhaps supplier diversity and maybe community. But the way we're thinking about it in this integrated fashion, I think, is absolutely what's emerging, and I think that's what the power of this role can be in the future. Totally. And just like the accountability and the responsibility you're seeing with that kind of active board involvement. This is so important to organizations now. And, and it's been fascinating watching the chief diversity officer more and more report into the CEO. Yeah. And I think that sends that sending a very clear message to organizations about how incredibly valuable this role is. Jyoti, I know that you have an incredibly broad role as well. So I'd love for you to kind of build on that. Yes, um, very similar to um, Ash is set up. Um, so I'll give you sort of uh, our structure at MGM Resorts International. Actually, prior to um, uh, my joining the company in 2019, uh, sustainability was under one leader and philanthropy and diversity and inclusion was under another leader. And so uh, the remits were combined and I joined MGM Resorts um, in the fall of 2019. And so uh, very similar to Ash, uh, I oversee diversity and inclusion, community engagement, all of our volunteer activities, the MGM Resorts Foundation, and then all of our what would be traditional corporate social responsibility. So environmental sustainability, um, publication of the annual, the company's annual uh, CSR report, um, all of our work around data disclosures, reporting, uh, long-term goal setting, the um, uh, overall ESG and CSR strategy. And then um, uh, early last year, uh, human resources was added to my remit. So I also serve as our chief people officer. And um, what, what's been really terrific about uh, that has been the bringing closer together the embedding of diversity, equity, and inclusion much more systematically into our HR processes, policies, practices, and bringing it sort of um, uh, just, just much more tightly aligned. Uh, and that's been, I think, a real positive move. And to be able to get uh, the resources organization 
behind the DEI agenda in a in a very powerful way has been compelling. Uh, from a reporting structure perspective, um, I'm on the executive committee at MGM Resorts International. I do report to our chief executive officer and president, and I also serve as the liaison into the CSR committee of the board. Interestingly, um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, sort of uh, straddles three board committees uh, for different reasons. Um, at times, I'm in the compensation committee uh, presenting. At times, I'm in the nominating governance committee presenting. And at times, I'm in the corporate social responsibility committee of the board presenting. I think you're going to see more of this as the practice and the domain matures there's just a heightened elevated interest and particularly around governance and driving accountability at the board level. Mm -hmm. And it isn't clear cut. It spans um, different uh, committees and depending on how the boards are structured, it can straddle mul mul multiple com committees. So I think that's gonna be an interesting evolution to watch as well in the years to come. That's extremely valuable. And I think, you know, all of this speaks to, you know, that broader accountability. And I think both of you touched on the accountability, the breadth of the role, but also the reporting piece, not only the reporting to the board, but I think more and more, I think over the course of the last year, it's about results. You know the you know not not just within the diversity role but in your broader role i'm sure jt from, from an hr perspective and ash i'm sure you experienced this as well um there's a real sense of you know how do we how do we embed this concept into the culture and then how do we measure our results so i want to start these are two big questions so i want to start with how what are you doing to kind of weave diversity, equity, and inclusion into the, the fabric of your company culture. Ash, do you want to start? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, it's so interesting, right, because you, when it's truly singing, when diversity is singing in an organization, it goes away from being sort of a check-in-the-box activity, something that someone does, to the lens through which you look at everything you do. You know, and I think that's when you, you, you think of it as being kind of woven into the fabric of the culture. Now, symbolically, structurally, there are certain things we do to kind of get going in that direction, right? So, for instance, at Aramark, you know, to the point that I was making earlier, the board is in the conversation. So not only, you know, to Jyoti's earlier point as well, not only do I have to talk about DEI to the NomGov committee and to the Human Resources Committee, but I actually have a member of our board of directors sitting on our executive diversity council. He actually co-chairs the executive diversity council for Airmark with our CEO. Um, and so, you know, again, starting at the board level, having that senior leadership buy-in and having visible leadership from our senior team is, is one piece of it. The second piece of it, I would say, is our employee resource groups. For us, if you think about Airmark and our business model, if you think about just in the U.S., we have people across 5,000 locations across the US and it's in every sector, right? So from healthcare to higher education to stadiums and arenas. Um, and so to make sure that we have these voices in, in the field organization, not just sitting in the headquarter building has been really important. So our powerful active employee resource groups are an important vehicle in, in making that happen. And we have, um, 10 of them actually in the process of, of uh, standing up our 11th. Um, and those executive, uh, those um, employee resource groups actually have annual plans tied into my DEI strategy. So they're not just affinity groups, they have active business roles to play. So, you know, our, our structure for how we approach DEI, and this is very similar to how many organizations think about it, is in terms of workforce, workplace, and marketplace, which is really about representation, culture, and everything else that you do that's outside of your uh, four walls, whether it's, you know, how you think about products and services or your supply chain, et cetera. Um, and our ERGs actually tie into specific business goals across those three pillars. And so it's a way for the, the, the organization to, you know, come together around DEI, self-select to work, you know, in, in DEI in, in a very uh, specific way. Um, and then there is leadership expectations, right? So our leadership competencies, one of the core competencies is around inclusive leadership. It's in, you know, when you think about who a high potential leader is at Aramark, it's one of the things we look at. We look at the composition of their teams. We look at how they think about talent development. I mean, so that idea of holding 
you know, the mirror up to an organization and saying, this is our standard for how we expect people to lead is, is also another way in which you embed into the culture. So I think it's a multi-pronged approach in how you think about how you embed DEI into the culture. But honestly, if you're doing it really well, it shouldn't be something that you think of as a separate thing. It's just like I said earlier, just the lens through which you do everything you do. Josie, I'm curious, I'm sure you're, you're, you'll probably share some of this perspective. Yeah. Yes, um, very well said, Ash, and um, uh, we think very similarly, and uh, you'll see lots of parallels uh, from, from our story and journey. Um, I, I would begin just by, by sort of just giving you a quick uh, snapshot of, of MGM Resorts. Uh, we're more than 50,000 people. Uh, we operate in 29 locations. We have two international locations in Macau. Um, and we're a very complex business. We represent the hospitality industry, but we're also in gaming, entertainment, in retail, in online and sports betting. Um, and um, it's, it's a very dynamic business. It's 24 by 7, 365 days of the year. Um, guests are always on our properties. And uh, our employees range from full-time to part-time to on-call to temporary um, to union, non-union. So it's, um, it's a very dynamic workforce. Um, against that backdrop, um, how we have um, uh, approached diversity, equity, and inclusion and really embedding it into uh, our culture at MGM Resorts, first and foremost, it starts with our corporate strategy. And I've worked very closely with Bill Hornbuckle, our CEO and president, in um, embedding diversity and inclusion in our corporate strategy. So people and planet are one of our strategic pillars of our corporate strategy. And diversity and inclusion is explicitly called out in that. And so what happens is when it's part of your corporate strategy, it becomes part of the dynamic of, um, of a lot of the, the different impacts you have around the business and how you're holding your leaders accountable and so on. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing for us, is um, uh, aligning with our company's vision, which is about entertaining uh, humanity and uh, people all over the world. Um, but dovetailing that is this notion of embracing humanity and protecting the planet. And what we've done under that is built a framework called Focused on What Matters, and diversity and inclusion is a core pillar of that. And that's really the mechanism through which we're driving it across the enterprise. Uh, we have also aligned our work to three very specific UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, addressing gender equality, reducing inequalities, and supporting decent work and economic growth. So at a global level, our work is directly supporting three, uh, in this area, three of the UN SDGs. Um, and we have set um, a total of 14 long-term ESG goals. Um, a number of them are diversity and inclusion focused. Um, so for example, um, spending with diverse suppliers at least 10% of our domestic uh, biddable procurement, um, expanding our diversity mentorship program for supplier diversity, um, making sure that we've got leadership training for our managers and so on. So we've got very specific goals and measures that are driving accountability for diversity and inclusion. And so when your managers know that they're contributing to a goal, the goal is being measured, the goal is being reported on in your annual CSR report, and all the way up to your management, executive committee, and board, um, that helps fuel this um, notion of support and uh, accountability, which I think is really key. So it's sort of a, um, you've got to approach it almost in a way of systems thinking where you're structurally embedding different levers around diversity and inclusion <clears throat> throughout your enterprise. So it touches your businesses, it touches your reporting mechanisms, it touches your governance and oversight, <clears throat> and then you've got a, a leader that's ultimately accountable for it. I think those are all, these, are, these are all phenomenal points. And, and what I want to really kind of pull out of that is the concept that diversity, equity, and inclusion is not the responsibility of HR. 
It is not the responsibility of your chief diversity officer. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is the responsibility of every single person within the organization. If it's, as you say, Ash, if it's managed appropriately and it's weaved into the culture, it should be an organic thing. And I think if we look at if we look at the, the millennial generation, if we look at Gen Z, if we look at Generation Alpha, if we look at the new generations coming into the workforce, there is an assumption that we will be committed you know, that, that to your point will be focused on what matters, you know, that we will have, you know, these, these processes in place and it will become just part of the fabric of the organization rather than like a specific initiative. It just is. Um, and that's really, really exciting. So it's, it's cool to hear about all of these various different tentacles of how we're kind of like getting DEI into the organization, which kind of brings us on to, and Jody, you, you kind of touched on this and I'd love you for you to expand a little bit more around how are we measuring? How are we measuring that, that change as we look at diversity and we look to really drive representation within our organizations? How are we thinking? Because I think measurement has always been a really touchy subject yes. um, and sensitive in the diversity space. So how, how have you navigated that? You, you absolutely have to measure and you have to have a measurement model that is designed and developed um, that you use consistently. Um, and so um, here's how we, we thought about it in, at, at MGM. We think about it both qualitatively and quantitatively. Um, and um, let me start with the quantitative piece. Um, there are really three main views you have of your measurement model uh, around representation. There's firstly the composition of your workforce at a particular point in time. There is your hiring, so who's coming in the door or into the walls of the organization. And then there's your turnover, so who's leaving and exiting uh, the door or the walls of your organization. That gives you a composite picture of the state of diversity. Uh, and what matters is measuring that consistently quarter over quarter, uh, year over year, so that then you, you get to see what your trend lines look like. And then you can um, identify where is it you need to intervene. Um, the way we're doing it at MGM Resorts, we've developed diversity dashboards that um, have this data. Uh, we look at gender, and we look at gender in the workforce as a composite, and we look at gender at different management levels, so women, women in management levels and women in the workforce. And then we look at racial and ethnic diversity in the same way in the workforce and then also at the different management levels. What I think is really important is for your leaders around the organization to be able to have access to that data and at a departmental level to be able to understand what that picture looks like for them. So if you are the chief financial officer or the chief legal officer, or if you're um, the head of um, the Borgata in New Jersey, um, you have a picture of what your workforce looks like and you can see where are the gaps, where do you need to improve, et cetera. So that's how I, uh, we're tackling the quantitative piece at MGM Resorts. But we also look at qualitative factors. So this might include, for example, your employee engagement survey, uh, which has a quantitative component, but qualitative as well, because you get verbatims and you get comments and feedback. So you could look at your employee engagement survey. You might want to look at your ratings, your rankings, uh, your marketplace eminence and recognition. Uh, these, are, these are some other um, areas. Other metrics we look at, we look at supplier diversity in our procurement. Um, we look at um, our diversity sales. Uh, this is in our convention business. So, um, um, you know, how many um, diverse customers do we bring or that, that have conferences or sales events uh, bringing diverse uh, groups um, to our properties? So that's a little bit around um, how we um, think about it. And the last couple of points I want to make is um, I'm, I'm on the view that you really want to create an environment that fuels meritocracy. I, I don't believe in quotas. I don't believe quotas work effectively. Um, and I'm of the view that you really want to create an environment where people are pushed to achieve their career aspirations and ambitions and reach their full potential and create an environment where meritocracy rises and you're in a performance-based environment. And so anything you can do to fuel that and to support that, I think is really key. 
Yeah, if I could, so, you know, it's interesting, Jyoti, we do live parallel lives. Um, so so we, we look at much the same sort of, you know, data points when it comes to how we measure DEI at Aramark. I will say what's been interesting, going back to this, this idea of elevating the function, evolving the function, I think evolving how we think about data is also an interesting sort of, you know, lens to this, right? So um, part of the exercise we've been going through these last few months at Aramark is to actually dig under the surface of some of our talent practices. And like Jyoti said, you know, thinking about who's coming into the organization, thinking about who's growing in the organization, who's leaving the organization is absolutely, you know, the approach to take. And then the, the, the click below that for us, which has been really revealing, is to look at, for instance, if you take your applicant tracking system and you think about who applies to your job, who makes it through the recruiter screening, who gets passed on to the hiring manager, who does the hiring manager interview, who does they who does who gets hired for the job. If you look at the demographic data breakdown for each one of those stages in your recruiting cycle, and you look at it for different jobs in your organization, you might learn a thing or two. You know, and very often we learn that you know, lack of diversity, if that's an issue for you, is not a homogenous problem. And, you know, and, and so it's, you know, yes, there is lack of diversity in a certain level of management, but I dig below the surface and I recognize that suddenly the, the, the real drop off is for representation in terms of Hispanic men and black women, you know, so you can really get down to that granular, granular level of data. It's something that, you know, there hasn't necessarily been appetite around doing that kind of work. We do it around our products and services. We do it around segmenting our customers, but we, you know, we're taking a very different approach towards looking at our own human capital data. And that gives us really interesting places to go make a difference, you know? And I think so that's, that's new for organizations to kind of flex their, you know, their AI muscle and their data analysis muscle around human capital in a new and novel way. Um, and that's a lot of what we've been testing as we think about uh, measures for diversity. And just an incredibly important point around, you know, what has, I think, historically perhaps be see, been seen as a predominantly qualitative space, just something which, you know, is like a good feeling. We want to feel like we're doing the right things and moving this into a more quantitative space where every story and every activity is backed up by data and analytics, which kind of demonstrate the direction. So important. And of course, Needless to say, you also touched on a subject which is very close to my heart, which is TA, talent acquisition and recruiting and how we get and how we get candidates into into the process. So needless to say, running a, a diversity recruiting firm, this is something which I'm incredibly passionate about. And um, I could say that that one of the things which I still hear countless times is, you know, well, I'd love to kind of bring diversity into this area, but I just can't find diverse candidates. Um, and we've heard, you know, a, a lot in, in the press around, around CEOs who've really got themselves in hot water for saying the same thing. And I think probably all of us would agree that, of course, there is diverse talent. There's diverse talent for every area that you're looking for. But my goodness, you need to make sure that your brand and your culture is appealing to that talent. And realistically, in some areas, there will be a dominant demographic and you will have to work hard in order to make sure that that proportion of diverse candidates who are looking to get into that space and into the succession plan for areas that perhaps have not traditionally been occupied by diverse candidates, that's an area where you're going to have to really go out and seek candidates. They're not necessarily going to organically come to you. And I think that that process, that shift in the dynamic of how we go out to market and how we recruit in order to kind of change that funnel activity, Ash, that you talked about, about like being able to do the analysis of like who's applying versus who have we gone out and sought out in order to try and change the representation uh, from a recruiting perspective is so important. So with that in mind, um, how do you build your network of diverse candidates. What is your value proposition for potential employees? I'd love to kind of know like how you're approaching that in terms of like bringing bringing in that that diverse uh, representation into the organization. You know, before we answer that, can I just go back to a point that you made, Felicity, which is really the important thing, which is, you know, 
you can have a recognition that you need to bring in certain kind of diversity into your organization, but you have to make sure your organization is ready for it, right? So you can attract great talent, but if they don't come into a culture that supports them or understands their worldview, I think that can be, you can run into a, a stone wall. So, you know, to that, to that point, and I should have mentioned this when we talked about culture a little bit, but what's been interesting, and this is especially interesting given sort of the, the events of spring and summer last year, you know, the conversations are on allyship, the conversations around putting ourselves in other people's shoes and seeing perspective in a different way has really changed this last year. And this, and this is not an airmark thing. This is a, you know, nationwide thing, right? And we're, we're struggling with it as, as a nation and, and globally, I think we're struggling with how do we do this and how do we do this well? Because you can have intentionality and intentionality is a very good first step. And then there has to be actual muscles that people have to build and skills that people have to build. And so we've been doing a lot of work at Aramark around allyship and really sort of codifying allyship and making sure that people have access to, to toolkits around how they, they do manage diverse teams and make sure that they have inclusive environments within their team. So I, that's total. Um, I just needed to say that as a backdrop before I talk about, you know, how we bring diverse talent in. Um, honestly, for us, it's been you know, exactly what you said, which is making sure that we're not going, we're not, you know, uh, fishing in the same ponds, you know, like making sure that we're diversifying the places that we source talent from. And, you know, our employee resource groups, as an example, have been a great um, uh, resource for us as we've thought about why they come into the organization, why they stay with us, the referrals that they bring into the organization has certainly been, you know, a differentiator in terms of diverse talent. But also, I mean, our, our campus recruiting program is an example. I mean, we, you know, uh, not during a COVID year, but in pre-pandemic years, I mean, we typically bring in, you know, up to 400 college students into our organization and entry-level management positions. And we are very, very conscious about making sure that we are going to sources of great diverse talent. We're sure, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're looking at HBCUs. We want to make sure that we're looking at students who have you know, different perspectives have different backgrounds who can bring different sort of values into the organization. And so being very intentional about diversifying your source of talent and not going back to, to use a term that most people under 40 don't even know what I mean when I say a Rolodex of, you know, everybody that you've ever been around. Um, and it's very easy for senior executives, especially who've had a career of building great talent to kind of pick up the phone and call, you know, Joe Smith, who they worked with two jobs ago because they know Joe Smith's great but Joe Smith may look just like you. And so how do you make sure that we're really, you know, and that's why this piece around making sure that managers understand what, why the power of diversity and why they want to build diverse teams is really important um, as, a, as a starting point. But yeah, so for us, it's been about really thinking about going to non-traditional sources of talent, being really open-minded and, and, and race and gender certainly are, are aspects of that, but it's also making sure that we have you know, LGBTQ Q plus communities um, involved in, in the process or people with disabilities. I mean, really thinking about broadening um, the way, you know, the places where you look for talent has been important. Yeah, I think needless to say, shifting shifting the inputs is critical to actually shifting the outputs. It feels like such an obvious context, but, you know, where things have been done similarly in the past, you want to kind of break out of that cycle. Jyoti, what have you been doing over at MGM? Yeah, so um, uh, some, some some parallels with Ash. Um, what 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 I would say um, a little bit different um, uh, uh, things like um, uh, we've been very intentional about building a portfolio of sponsorships and what I'd call strategic partnerships and alliances with centers of influence in the diverse communities, and this is both geographically as well as across different segments. Um, and those have been incredible conduits for us in terms of uh, pipeline, candidate referrals, exposure in local markets. We also have um, um, uh, requirements in some locations where we've built properties, for example, where we've got um, mandates and requirements by the state of um, hiring and so uh, it's not an option for us. Uh, we have to uh, hire a diverse workforce in some of our, in the jurisdictions in which we operate um, and fulfill certain uh, agreements. And so um, we have dedicated teams that support us in that effort. 
Um, we tap historically black colleges and universities as an example. We go to not some of the traditional schools uh, for recruiting. But I think also thinking about things like employee referrals um, and so on. So I think it's um, a, a pretty wide net and a range um, of different strategies that we have uh, in terms of attracting good talent. But coming back, Felicity, to a point you made um, uh, at the start of this, this sort of topic, um, I think a lot of it begins with the value proposition that you put out in the marketplace. Great point. And what is it you're known for as an employer? And so um, uh, I, I was really proud of some recent work that our human capital, human resources team, senior leadership group and I did together uh, as part of our people strategy and um, a framework. But we carved out a whole section around defining, you know, what our people can expect from MGM. And, uh, you know, some of the things that we, we sort of charted out that form part of that value proposition, for example, are we're a company that really helps you increase your future employability. Um, you know, we're a company that is a great place to work where you can build the career that you want, um, where your ideas and your voices and your views matter, um, where it's a fun place to work. Um, and, 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 you know, we have sort of um, our, 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 our list of 10, um, but that just gives you a little bit of a feel and a flavor for sort of how we're thinking about it. But it is very much top of mind. And I think this notion of an employee value proposition has to be lived. It has to be felt. It has to be imbibed. And one of the, the pieces of work that we just recently launched and that's afoot for us right now is work on culture. And we're actually in the midst of an assessment of our culture, uh, looking to really understand, dive deep, and evaluate our culture, and then reimagine it. And uh, we've got sort of a cross-enterprise um, cultural committee we've put together. Um, we're working with Gallup on this and really excited about um, some fresh thinking and fresh work on that. That's actually a really good point, and I'd love for you to expand on that because the, the one thing which I was thinking, which I, which I know comes up a lot, is... How have you grown in the DEI space? And more specifically, how do you advocate for DEI with those colleagues who don't necessarily understand its importance yet? Which, by the way, does not necessarily, I've, I've come across some phenomenal allies within the male community. So it doesn't, it's not, it's not the sole domain of straight white men to not necessarily understand diversity. You know, it's not necessarily a generational thing. It's not necessarily about a political leaning. Like everyone can have different opinions on this topic for a host of different reasons, but there will be in all large organizations, people who perhaps haven't quite grasped the importance of DEI. So, so I'd love that you, you, you made a start on that, Jyoti. I would love for you to yes. kind of like dig into that a little bit more in terms of like how you're kind of building those concepts of like allyship and integrating within those, within those communities, within your organization that perhaps haven't kind of grasped the importance. Yeah. So we're doing um, several things, but I'll just headline um, a few of them. The first is the tone at the top. Our chief executive officer, Bill Hornbuckle, is our biggest advocate and steward of this work. He talks about it. He and I co-author articles. Um, we um, have done talks together. Uh, he really lives and embodies um, this work um, in, and role models it in a very meaningful way. The second is um, we've, we've launched a series called Courageous Conversations where we're bringing cohorts together of diverse talent to talk to our CEO and members of our board around what the experience is like, um, what are the barriers, obstacles, challenges that they've encountered, um, where do they see opportunities, and what do, how do we need to change, and what do we need to change. Um, I, I think another important thing that we have done is begun to really call out this notion of sponsorship, it's not not just mentorship, but sponsorship, and that it is a leadership expectation of our leaders that they be sponsoring others. And um, we just launched, for example, last year, an accelerated leadership program. This is a top talent program for our executive director and vice presidents 
we've built a sponsorship component as part of that leadership development program. We've paired 50 of the participants with 50 of our senior vice president and above levels. So we're, we're introducing structural components to facilitate um, some of these changes. So, so there isn't one silver bullet, but it's really a combination, I think, of many things that you systematically and structurally stand up that I think really help. Thank you. Ash, what are, what are your thoughts? Because I know that you're going to, I know that you've got some ideas on this. Well, actually, I want to go back to, to Jyoti's point around courageous conversation. So, you know, I, I started talking about this a little bit briefly, but, you know, uh, right on the heels of the calls for social justice in the country last year, we did a couple of things. Um, one was these just for us circles that we created for our black employees. Um, and so we understood that they were dealing with with trauma, you know, this idea of seeing um, your community um, impacted the way, you know, they have for many, many years, but certainly in this sort of um, elevated kind of conversation around it certainly stirred up feelings for our black employees. And we didn't want to we didn't want to leave that unnoticed. We wanted to notice it. We wanted to support it. And so we created just for our circles, um, which were facilitated by it through our uh, employee assistance program, we brought in, um, you know, licensed therapists, um, pastors very often into the conversation to guide conversations. And, you know, I, I did not attend, but, you know, from, from all of the, the feedback I've heard from many uh, of those sessions, they were just powerful conversations. And not just, you know, certainly an opportunity to, to reflect on what was going on in society and, and mourn, perhaps, um, some of what what had been experienced, but also to then think proactively about w how it could translate into a different and better workplace for everyone and how we could, you know, work together uh, and support each other. So there were some really robust conversations around that. But in parallel to that, we also launched these allyship sessions that I was talking about. And these were workshops. We didn't mandate them. We just made them available. And, you know, in the middle of what for us operationally was a traumatic year, I mean, we had, think about it, our frontline managers, you know, were in some cases essential workers who were going in every day during the pandemic, you know, because they worked in, in businesses that were open in hospitals, for instance. Um, they were, you know, and, and so they were dealing with sort of working under difficult circumstances, perhaps having their children home from school, perhaps having elderly parents they couldn't see. And, and in the middle of all of that, they, they made time to come to these allyship workshops because we had our non-Black colleagues trying to figure out how to be supportive, how to make sense of what was going on and how to be supportive. And so the allyship workshop opened up opportunities for them to really think through that. And what was also really telling was this idea, and perhaps this goes back to what if I don't understand, part, part of, and I said in, on many of the allyship workshops, part of the conversation was, I don't understand help me understand, you know, asking questions that they didn't feel safe asking anywhere else or asking questions that they, without the resource of having anyone else to go to, would perhaps go to the one black employee on their team. And it wasn't that employee's job to educate them, you know? And so, so it opened up conversations in a new and different way across the organization around the power of allyship, the power of, of representation and why it matters. And more importantly, perhaps this piece around equity. So everybody talked about diversity and inclusion for the longest time. You, you are seeing equity emerge in the conversation more and more. So what is equity and why does it matter? And how is equity different from equality? And, you know, and this idea of kind of just making people understand that, you know, this is not about leveling the playing field is what people often say, but it's like really understanding that people have different starting points. They're not even on the same field sometimes. And so how do you how do you really think about creating equitable opportunities? Um, and so those are a lot of the conversations that happened within our ally workshop and talking about sort of changing culture one conversation at a time. I think that is the kind of thing that that, you know, impacts culture in the long run. And then the one other point I would make around value prop has been that, you know, it's so interesting because right now the conversation and going back to Jyoti and, and my opening comments around ESG and the platform around ESG, our shareholders are asking us about what we're doing around diversity, equity, and inclusion. That would not have been the case five years ago. You know, I mean, we're picking up the phone and talking to, you know, the Black Rocks of the world and the state streets of the world, and they want to know what we're doing around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so 
the, the business case now and what we're able to kind of define to people who don't necessarily maybe understand it is a 360 view on it. It's you can't hire employees, great employees, unless you have a point of view around this. You don't have a sustainable business unless you have a point of view around this. Your clients and consumers want to know that you have you look like the people you serve. So this is really now not, it's a business imperative in in a very heightened way. And that often just, you know, educating people on that very often helps um, get through this hump of, I don't get why this is important or why are we doing this work? Yeah. And, and I think you make a really valid point because I think in, in so many cases, it's, it's historical fear or concern that you're just going to say the wrong thing. So, so rather than saying the wrong thing, I'm just not going to get involved in the conversation and I fear that 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 position is passed and in order to be a progressive organization and in order to be an employee who's actually going to progress in your career you have to have some form of position uh, that you take on this and an understanding and so you know it's it's incredibly encouraging to hear about the courageous conversations the just for us conversations that that you've had because I feel like of course, we've listened to employees in the past, but the ability to mobilize quickly in an environment of trauma um, and particularly in an environment where we were already facing some mental health concerns because we were all forced into this COVID environment, which was so atypical from our usual working practices. I think it's so incredibly important to have that heightened communication with employees and that recognition of the fact that, that as organizations, we need to go the extra mile in order to kind of make sure that this is part of the culture. So what I would love to close on is just getting an understanding of, from both of your perspectives, as you look at like this year and who knows what will happen beyond, beyond this year. So I'm gonna make it really small, but by all means you could extend it out if you would like. Um, what does success look like? If you like coming into this year with all of like the crazy challenges that we faced in 2020, you know, we're now in March, we've got like, we've got like a, a decent sort of component of 2021 still to go. As you look at this year and all of these fabulous programs that you, that you put in place and all of the things that you're looking to achieve, what does success look like? Jyoti. Yeah, so for, uh, Felicity... Personally and professionally, by the way. <laughs> it might be a vacation at some point, so... <laughs> so I would say uh, professionally, um, bringing back as many of our employees as possible back to work, that is our number one priority. Uh, welcoming back our guests, being in the hospitality and the hotel industry... Um, making sure all our doors are open and uh, getting business volumes back so that we can bring every employee back. I, I would say that is our number one priority. I think um, in terms of how I would measure the success, um, engagement levels. Um, we were really heartened. We did our employee engagement survey um, last fall, and we only had a negative 1% differential from the prior year. And considering everything we went through in the pandemic, shutting down every property, every restaurant, every um, bar, venue, uh, that was pretty remarkable. And I think just a testament to the people of MGM Resort. So I think for me, um, opening, bringing people back, keeping um, engagement, motivation high uh, would constitute success. On a personal level, yes, a two-week holiday in the south of France, uh, some point in the summer would be divine. <laughs> Fair, entirely fair. What about you, Ash? Um, well, so it's it's interesting. I, I would, you know, actually a lot of what Jyoti said resonates for me as well. I mean, you know, Airmark, we think of ourselves as a hospitality company and hospitality is all about, you know, people coming together and celebrating a chance to be with each other. And we've, you know, obviously not had a lot of that in the past year. So the thing that I'm most excited about and our teams are most excited about is having people come back together and serving people as they come back together. So much like jo Jyoti, I think that's that's the thing that I'm most excited about. Um, and success will look like, you know, especially in this area around DEI, um, going back to my, my starting comment about just being part of the culture and not being a check in the box activity, I think, you know, holding on to some of the, the momentum we have right now 
and making sure that that momentum is realized in terms of actionable outcomes that people are excited about that continues to kind of then, you know, snowball into bigger and better things for all of us as a community, right? Um, and personally, um, well, I have two things. One, one, I want to remember to be grateful because despite the really difficult year we've had, I mean, I've had two kids um, home from school for most of it, um, but I'm really grateful. I mean, you know, for, for everyone who, whose health has remained, st- you know, okay throughout this whole thing, the fact that, you know, I've got, I've, I've had lunch with my kids more often than I've ever had in their lives before now. Um, they're just small things that I've learned to be really grateful about. And I want to bring that gratitude with me. And I'm really looking forward to seeing my mother who lives in Australia and I haven't seen her for a year and a half at this point. So I cannot wait for, for that to, to go back um, to, its, you know, to be able to go visit with her. So lots to look forward to in the coming year. Absolutely. And I think, I think great goals. And I think that that, that gratitude, that, that ability for us all to come back together is just so incredibly important in this space and is going to be so, so healthy for us all. And from my own personal perspective, over the course of the past year, we were able to maintain a placement rate of 86% diverse candidates, where when you see record numbers of women, particularly leaving the workforce due to COVID, due to the points that you made, Ash, around like childcare, so important to be able to really focus on like that representation. So without further ado, I want to thank Jyoti and Ash for all of their contributions today if you want to reach out um, you are welcome to do so through linkedin i know that we would all love to hear from you and would love to continue the conversation thank you to hotel Ezra cornell and to our host today um, thank you very much bye We're so excited to see that you've received your amenity box for HEC 96, and I'm sure you're curious what's inside. Our guest amenity managers have been hard at work this year trying to find the perfect amenities for you to love and cherish for the year to come. All of these amenities and donations have been picked by our guest amenity managers, and we cannot wait to share them with you. HEC cookies made fresh and packaged by the culinary team. Baked to perfection and sealed for freshness, these cookies will leave you wanting more. With four amazing flavors of Earl Grey, matcha, turmeric rose, and Mexican hot chocolate, there's sure to be one you'll love. We included a body butter from Avidal's Apiary, a local business. We wanted to include a piece of the Finger Lakes region as we know how much you guys are missing Ithaca this year. This beautiful scent of Hope Springs will refresh in you and remind you of the hope of the future. Your new desk favorite. Keep your HSC 96 pen and notepad close to write down all your amazing ideas. Thanks to our amazing donor Starbucks, we're able to provide you your very own coffee care package. Pairs perfectly with your reusable K-cup or your own coffee maker at home. Not a coffee person? Don't worry, we have something for you too. Our tea made for HEC this year called Spice Ithaca will remind you of all that you love about it here. Thank you so much to Harney and Sons for your amazing donation. So have that coffee breath, maybe mask breath, have a piece of gum. Once again, thank you to Starbucks for this donation. Our HEC cookbook developed this year by our food and beverage team features 29 food and cocktail recipes. Our cookbook would not have been possible without our HEC students and our great donor, Heritage Cookbooks, to help us bring these recipes to you. Pour your favorite wines and beverages into this custom HEC stemless wine glass. The perfect piece to celebrate HEC the entire year. HEC hand sanitizer. Is there more to say? Although it is not a substitute for hand washing, use it as an extra layer of protection to keep yourself and others safe. In the age of Zoom meetings and Skype calls, it was only natural we included an HEC camera cover. Be seen and unseen when you want with a little reminder of HEC. And of course, the amenity that you have all been waiting for and the longest HEC amenity tradition, the HEC 96 plate. Designed by our team here and the team at Haviland in France, we've collaborated on this plate this year. Thank you to Haviland for being a partial donor on this plate as we could not have done it without them and are so appreciative of their support. We hope that you enjoy the HEC 96 plate and will use it for years to come and will continue the tradition. We hope you enjoy your amenities this year and cannot wait to see you for future HECs in Ithaca. Hi, my name is Ariel Staffan and I'm the design director for HEC 96. I first want to thank you all so much for coming out to our HEC at home this year. The last part of the conference that we are presenting to you is our HEC mocktail experience. In this mocktail box, 
you will find three incredible mocktails, each of which are named with a coordinate. These coordinates are representative of three locations around the world. Each mocktail has a unique ingredient in it that is representative of that location that the mocktail is named after. In this box, you will also find some hand-picked happy hour snacks, most of which are donated from the local Ithaca area. So we hope that this gives you a little bit of a taste of your home on the hill, even though you can't be here in Ithaca with us. I once again want to thank you so much for joining us at our HEC at Home this year, and I will see you all in the HEC virtual dining room.
Lecture Series, but we are also joined by the 96th Annual Hotel Escher Cornell. We'd like to introduce to you Austin Kick, the Programs and Innovations Director for this year's HEC Conference. Thank you, Isha. The Hotel Ezra Cornell Conference represents an opportunity for students to get leadership opportunities and showcase the hospitality education of the hotel school. And while typically a three-day conference that occurs in person at Cornell, we're excited that we've transitioned to a two-day virtual conference that you can all enjoy at home. The Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series provides students the opportunity to meet some of the most distinguished industry professionals in hospitality and learn their insights and experiences. And today we are thrilled to introduce Mr. Evan Frazier, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Advanced Leadership Initiative. And we couldn't think of a better person to invite for this collaborative event because he's such a proud alumnus of our program. Now in his role, Mr. Frazier will lead the strategic expansion of the organization and build a larger pipeline of African-American executives in leadership roles. And prior to his role at the Advanced Leadership Initiative, Mr. Frazier served as the Senior Vice President of Community Affairs at Highmark Health. During his time here at Cornell, Mr. Frazier co-founded the National Society of Minorities in Hospitality and is currently the chair of the NSMH Legacy Fund. We are so excited to welcome Mr. Frazier back to the hotel school. Thank you so much. What a, what a pleasure it is to be here with all of you. Um, uh, truly an honor to be uh, speaking at my alma mater. Um, I want to thank, uh, first of all, uh, the amazing Dean's assistants, uh, Caroline, Carolyn, and uh, Isha. Uh, thank you for uh, what you've done. You've guided me along uh, the whole time here, and uh, so grateful to you and your, your bright promise for the future. Um, also want to take a moment to thank uh, Dean, uh, Dean Walsh. Uh, thank you. You have been uh, just incredible, your leadership within the hotel school, and uh, just uh, makes us all very, very proud. And so I'm, I'm so pleased to be here. And uh, your, the support from Anitra Garcia has been amazing along the way as well. So thank you for this opportunity. Uh, do want to also give a special uh, uh, shout out to our HEC 96 leadership, uh, Sarah Kimball. Uh, who I know is the student managing director, and of course, uh, Austin Kick, who has been making sure that uh, um, I have uh, all the things that I need on this end to uh, share in this experience. So um, I know he's the programs and innovation director. So thank you all. Such an honor, such a pleasure to be here with uh, each and every one of you. Try to do this gently here. So uh, I, um, my experience at Cornell uh, has been uh, what an incredible experience it was for me. Uh, it, it really did shape and define uh, a lot of uh, what I do today. Uh, it helped to prepare me in some incredible ways, both uh, for a career in hospitality uh, as well as in business. And uh, while it, uh, uh, the curriculum was an important part of it, the student experience was also a very, very important part of it for me. And so I'm, I'm really grateful to have uh, the whole experience that Cornell provided me uh, during, uh, during this time. Um, I, um, you know, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, building diverse leadership and the importance of that. And while, while I know part of it is going to focus on kind of racial equity. I do uh, want to just take a moment to recognize that uh, this is Women's History Month. And uh, I know earlier this week it was the International Women's Day. And uh, so I want to acknowledge the importance uh, that women play within our industry and within leadership. And uh, just important to make sure that as we think about diversity, we also think about the progress uh, that uh, women have made and uh, the struggle that they continue to fight uh, to uh, continue to elevate uh, within our society. So just wanted to uh, do a, a quick pause there. Uh, I do want to share one thing. I just, uh, as I think about today and as, as I think about HEC, my very first HEC experience uh, goes back to when I was a pre-freshman. In fact, I remember uh, people like uh, 
uh, Luis LeBoy. Uh, and and uh, he kind of hosted me during uh, 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 my time on campus uh, before I was even a freshman. And then meeting people like Clyde Robinson, who was uh, really the founder, pioneer of SMH, Society of Minority Hoteliers. And uh, so I've got to share one prop with you as we're starting here. And that is, I still have my plate uh, that goes all the way back to, uh, this is uh, HEC 63. So just want to let you know, I'm still hanging on to it with, with prize. So congratulations on the first uh, virtual NSMH here. So I, um, uh, as we get started, um, I, I do also want to share that about 10 years ago, about a decade ago, uh, and somehow uh, it always seems to be as I make these career transitions, I had the wonderful opportunity to uh, uh, be part of the Dean's Lecture Series, uh, and it was about 10 years ago. So I, I, uh, it's, it's either one of everything. It's either once every 10 years or it's whenever I change jobs. So I guess the, 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 the next round, I'll have a better sense uh, the, the next decade. I'll let you... Let, we'll, we'll see what uh, how the trend follows there. So I wanted to, as I talk about my Cornell experience, um, part of my Cornell experience uh, really related to um, the formation of uh, NSMH, um, what was amazing in the classroom, uh, but also the campus experiences. For me, uh, I recall very vividly of uh, being on campus uh, at the time, I lived in in College Town. Uh, uh, Cascadilla was the the building I the the hall I, I lived in, and I, I remember just you know really um, you know feeling a little bit isolated. I mean that that's probably the best way I can describe it. And as I as I went through my experience, there was a group on campus called SMH. Society of Minority Hoteliers at the time. And again, I mentioned Clyde Robinson and uh, Clyde and others um, had kind of introduced SMH to me as it was forming. I guess it had grew out of the universities uh, or, or the hotel schools, uh, a, a Minority Affairs Committee, I believe that they had uh, at that time. And uh, I have to tell you the experience in SMH when I was a freshman in getting connected feeling a greater sense of belonging, uh, never forget some of the trips that we took and the alumni that came in to speak, you know, really uh, helped to inspire me uh, to, to want to do more as it relates to the type of group that we had. And uh, uh, even reaching out to other universities uh, uh, out there. So uh, that really is what sparked initial interest in creating NSMH. Um, and uh, the people who are listed in this photo, uh, there's Michael Burkeen, uh, which is all the way far to the left. Um, Michael uh, was the first person I had conversations with about this vision of NSMH. He had a vision as well. And so we shared our vision collectively to the Society of Minority Hoteliers at the time uh, in the hotel school. And uh, at the time, Alfred Watts, uh, who uh, had just become president of the chap, you know, the the club for SMH, uh, and then Penny Pen Penny went uh, Penelope. We we call her Penny. Uh, Penny, uh, along with Alfred, Michael, and I, started meeting regularly uh, and and really starting to think about this broader vision for the university. You know, not just for Cornell, but even more broadly, uh, how do we create an umbrella structure so that what we have going on at Cornell, we can share those same experiences with other universities across the country? And what we quickly found out is that it turns out there weren't other groups meeting the way that we were, having the activities that we were, having the bonds. And so it turns out that we needed to uh, quickly start to put that in place. And, and so as we talk about our theme today in terms of uh, building diverse leadership, I wanted to take a minute to kind of go back and really talk through um, how Cornell has impacted me in my ability to do what I'm doing even today. And so as I think about um, the theme you could see in front of you, uh, unity, a key to success, that was our very first theme that we came up with. And, and uh, I'll, I'll never forget 
our very first national conference. It was um, uh, in uh, February 1990. And we had a gentleman. Uh, he was, I believe, the vice president of EEO for Marriott. And uh, he uh, posed some questions to us. Uh, first, he told us that, um, you know, with the understanding that two-thirds of the industry is minorities and women, he asked us the question. He said, out of the predominant 50,000 hotels in the country at that time, he asked us the question, how many of them, uh, how many general managers, you know, one per hotel, do you think were African-American? What percentage? And so someone guessed, uh, well, 5%, someone guessed 3%. He said, okay, well, if you take 1%, 1% of 50,000 is 500. He said, but the reality is out of 50,000, there were only 15 black general managers, three black women, two of the three black women general managers were right there with us at that conference. And for me, that was a, such a powerful message that it sent. And it said that, okay, no, this isn't just about connecting with one another. NSMH had to be about advancing, um, you know, advancing uh, for minorities as a whole in the industry, you know, the advancement of minorities in hospitality. And that's really how NSMH that started to really fuel not only the social part of it, but started to, to really fuel uh, the social justice part of it, even though that's not exactly how we termed it at that time. Well, over the years, as you can, as you can see, um, Cornell has uh, you know, come quite a distance. Uh, it's uh, more than 30, 30 years uh, since we started uh, NSMH. Uh, and again, it grew from the National Society or Society of Minority Hoteliers to the National Society of Minority Hoteliers to what it is today, the National Society of Minorities in Hospitality, NSMH. Um, this is a photo of, uh, in the last couple of years here. Uh, and uh, is, I believe this is at our 30th, uh, uh, 30th National Conference. And uh, just some amazing folks. I think you probably see some familiar faces uh, uh, Victor Young, you can't hide. You're in the back over there. Uh, but thank you for, for uh, what you all are doing. Uh, I had the pleasure today for lunch uh, to have met uh, Faith uh, Jepchumba and Vike is Ready, uh, who are the uh, president and vice president of Cornell's chapter of NSMH. So I'm very proud of you and, and the whole chapter and what you guys are doing. I'm also pleased to share that uh, Cornell has several national Officers, um, Bo uh, Maybuck, uh, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, Alejandro Paulino, and Emily John. And so I wanted to just uh, acknowledge and thank you. And Victor, thank you for your continued leadership and guidance uh, for promoting uh, NSMH and other really important groups uh, that are part of the campus. I do uh, wanted to share this slide also because it's so important to understand that it started at Cornell. And at one point, I know we had over 100 chapters. Uh, and, and as we continue to go, I don't know what the number is today, if it's 85 or 80. I'm, I'm not sure the exact number, but there's been major progress over the years. Uh, and for being a student-run organization, uh, I'm very, very proud of what NSMH is doing to create opportunities, to help people feel more connected, to help build people's networks, to help people find not only uh, permanent placement, but even internships along the way and to recruit into the industry. Okay. Uh, in the last uh, few years, in, in 2015, um, uh, fellow co-founders and, and, and a few uh, other folks, uh, we, we came together to say, how can we support the ongoing longevity of, of NSMH? Uh, we, we all felt, uh, knew how important it was and, and, and continues to be, uh, and we wanted to help. And so we created kind of a foundation arm of NSMH. And uh, that foundation arm we called the NSMH Legacy Fund, and we, we created independent from NSMH for the benefit of NSMH. Uh, we created out of the Pittsburgh Foundation. And so that's something we've been building over the last few years. You can see the covers of the annual reports that we've done and we continue to build that. We believe it's so important to invest back in so that NSMH 
um, can live another 30 years and continue to benefit the industry. What we found is that uh, just the graduates and alum that have come out of NSMH, both at Cornell, but across the country, really, uh, is that people are finding greater leadership roles, a greater sense of connectedness, a greater sense of pride about hospitality. And all of that is very important for uh, diversity within our industry. So as we, as we talk about diversity and we think about uh, the importance of, of um, you know, really the importance of uh, uh, of DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, there are a lot of studies out there, right? Um, there is, uh, you know, studies like McKinsey and BCG, uh, they talk about the importance uh, of diversity and inclusion, you know, um, 36% uh, are more likely to have industry leading profitability with diverse teams, right? Just as just one example. There are a number of other examples uh, as I think about, you um, you know, diversity itself, uh, if you think about uh, uh, other statistics, uh, it says by 2022, 75% of the companies uh, with diverse and inclusive teams will exceed their financial targets. Uh, gender diversity and inclusive teams outperform their less inclusive counterparts by 50%. And if you think about the benefits of uh, diversity, expanded creativity and problem solving, better decision-making, increased profitability and productivity. 55% uh, of job seekers are looking for demonstrated inclusive companies. And uh, again, better employee uh, engagement and retention. Again, this all goes to the bottom line, saves replacement costs and new hires, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, ultimately, it's better company reputation and so that the brand is enhanced because uh, companies decide to become diverse and, and inclusive in their uh, uh, cultures and their priorities. Understanding all these amazing benefits, if you look broadly across corporate America and you look at the top Fortune 500 companies, uh, you look at the top Fortune 500, only four black CEOs and uh, this is, uh, this is uh, not representative of the population. It's not representative of where we should be. And it's just an example of how far we still have to go today. You know, think back to the example uh, with uh, where the industry was uh, in 1990. There, you know, there was less than 0.1% of African Americans uh, that were even at the general manager level. And so we knew there was a lot of growth that was needed then, but look at where we are today. This is less than 1% of uh, CEOs for Fortune 500 companies. So that brings me to another um, uh, challenge that we're facing. And this one is a local challenge that I've faced uh, as we think about the career. Uh, my career in Pittsburgh, you know, it turns out that um, in Pittsburgh, uh, we're about half of where other peer cities are and that and even peer cities are not at a large level. So when we talk about leadership roles, you know, kind of vice president and above, we're about half of our peers. And a number of years ago, this really, um, you know, was pretty clear to myself and a number of others we need to do something about this. We need to, uh, we have a responsibility. And, and it wasn't that there was no awareness. I mean, there were, there were organizations and, and some of the civic leaders, they're all talking about, you know, we need to do something for the African-American population and become more diverse as a city and as a region. But there just did not seem to be any mechanism to help us to get there. And so that, that's really how this idea of the Advanced Leadership Initiative came about. In fact, one of uh, uh, kind of the, the, the guys who uh, helped to kind of co-found, and it was a kind of founding co-chair with me uh, of TALI, uh, the Advanced Leadership Initiative, he did a study and he looked at the top 25 uh, public organizations that were headquartered in our city and looked at all of their C-suite uh, so that's, uh, you know, those are the 
the the uh, uh, CEOs and the direct reports uh, at that higher uh, kind of uh, CEO cabinet level, and looked across in you know when they were trying to find African Americans in the C-suite, and uh, the the report came back and said it was less than guess what 0.1 percent, and so those are the things that uh, said we really need to stop talking about it and let's do something unique. Let's, and so we decided, you know, we're not going to talk about it anymore. We're, we're going to take some, some steps. And I had crafted a vision. Uh, and the, the, the vision was this idea of creating a world-class executive leadership program to help African-Americans. Uh, well, one, to help our city become more diverse and our region become more diverse. And uh, so as we, as, we, as we did that, we, we really, uh, you know, took the time to create a world-class executive leadership program that was really customized uh, to addressing the issues that we were dealing with at that time and, and continued to, to uh, face. But the emphasis was, let's stop talking about it. Let's do something. And the novel idea was, okay, let's invest. If, if we know what we're trying to do, let's invest, have companies invest in black people, in black executives, in, in talent uh, that we believe can continue to grow and develop and help create the diverse leadership that we're looking for for our region. So that was when Ali was born, uh, the Advanced Leadership Initiative. And again, our, our focus is about building the pipeline for African-American uh, leaders um, to help our city become uh, inclusive uh, in, in the way uh, that it, that uh, we all know that diverse cities are the ones that are growing. And so our goal was to dramatically improve the regional presence of African-Americans uh, in executive leadership roles. And again, the goal is to create an inclusive and prosperous community. And so very proud of what we're doing there. Um, the way that we have done it was we created the, uh, what's on this next slide here, um, we created uh, the Executive Leadership Academy, and we did it in partnership with uh, Carnegie Mellon and their business school. And uh, it, the, it's really there's four fundamental uh, areas here, but there's two broad issues we're trying to solve for. One, we're trying to solve for the issue that we have uh, uh, some great talent, and uh, we, we ulti ultimately uh, what we're finding is that uh, when people – uh, are trying to advance, people kind of get stuck in mid-management. Mid and in order to advance, uh, a lot of people feel they have to kind of leave the city and leave the region. And we said, we, got, we have to address that. We're never going to become the city or region that we can be to be able to grow if we don't have diverse leadership. And then we're not going to be able to do it if we can't retain uh, our talent and, and help people to be able to grow professionally uh, in our area. So that's, that's one thing. The second thing we're trying to solve for is you have some amazing talent uh, that will come into our region. Uh, and the challenge is this is talent that could go anywhere. And so if you look around people, if you don't see someone who kind of, you know, um, shares the same values, you know, if you look around, you you feel like you're always the only one in a leadership role, that gets discouraging. People feel disconnected. And so our other goal was we don't want people to feel disconnected. We want people to feel connected and included and feel that there's an opportunity for them to grow and advance right in our region. And so that's really what we're working towards. We're really working towards that. So our, we created the Executive Leadership Academy. Uh, the goal here is every year have companies in our community invest in 20 to 25 high potential African-Americans, people who are either in the vice president or director role, um, possibly a senior management uh, we have some senior vice presidents that are also part of our, our cohorts. Uh, and the goal is to invest in this talent each year to really build that pipeline. And so we put people, we created this customized program, one with world-class executive education uh, instruction. Uh, and in addition to your traditional strategy and finance and business and management, uh, those uh, parts of the curriculum, we also address issues that are very unique to the African-American experience. Uh, and, and not just African-Americans, but others, uh, which is, okay, so how does race play itself out in organizations? What are the best practices for dealing with uh, bias 
in overcoming bias. How do we help people to understand the environment and navigate uh, to, to really understand what's taking place? And so that's a really critical part of what we're providing in addition to strategy and finance and operational and innovation leadership. We weave in uh, uh, an understanding of, of race and how it plays itself out within organizations and how can you be successful. We also pair each individual with their own executive coach. So every year, or for each person, uh, they'll have the opportunity to select a coach, either locally or nationally, um, depending upon, uh, they'll have a chance to kind of interview the coaches. Uh, then the third part here is we pair people with uh, an executive mentor. And this is really important because in order to keep people within our region, um, we also know from research as well as from personal uh, experiences of African-American leaders is that, you know, meritocracy will take you to a certain place. You know, it's a prerequisite. But the reality is in order to move into really senior level roles uh, and to move into the C-suite, you know, you can't get there on your own merits alone. You have to be invited into the circle. So in other words, someone has to sponsor you into that circle. And typically, that's not been what's been happening for African Americans. And that's, that's been part of the challenge. And so what we've done was we recognize that the research backs this up. And it basically says that if we can create sponsorship for individuals, that cuts across racial and gender lines in a very, very powerful way. When someone says, look, I'm going to look out for, you know, on your behalf um, and, uh, and, 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 and really be someone who is an advocate for your success, um, that makes a big difference. And so we created this idea of executive mentors with the hope that based on the mentoring relationship, it would help to forge a, a sponsor relationship. And because we know that in order to move into the C-suite, you have to be sponsored into it. And so this is part of our, our goal is to create those bonds. And all of the mentoring relationships are within our region because we recognize how important it is to be able to retain talent in our own region because that's part of what we're, what we're doing within this industry. And then the final part is the peer network. You know, we found that uh, the peer network uh, is such a powerful part of this. Uh, we have people, when we come together, we have three cohorts now. The first cohort, we had 23. Second cohort, we had 28. And we launched our third cohort this past January with another 28. And what we found is that uh, while all of the other components are critical in their own right, the peer network has created such a bond and has really dealt with this issue of people feeling disconnected or isolated people feel connected. They started to understand there are people who are sharing their same experiences and even people who've been in our region for a long time. Uh, the majority of folks, they don't know. So these are new people we're introducing them to. So after the first few years of uh, advancing, uh, we're very fortunate to be able to go from an initiative and then build into an institute and so as of uh, this past Monday, I became the president and CEO of the Advanced Leadership Institute. And our goal is to advance uh, African-American leadership to strengthen companies, institutions, and communities across America. We're gonna start by first uh, solidifying the model that we're building in Pittsburgh you know, because it's working. Uh, not only are we creating in uh, infrastructure, within our community, um, what we're finding is that, you know, we're creating an, an, a whole ecosystem of people that are supporting our cohort members. So right now, our cohort community is about 80. We have an executive committee uh, and, a, and board. We have an advisory board. We also have a CEO council where we have 17 CEOs of, of major companies that meet with us uh, a couple times a year uh, and also have committed to supporting our cohort members to be successful and to find those opportunities for elevation. So proud uh, to see how it's coming together. Uh, and as we start to think about the next step, 
uh, that's what the Institute represents. I'm so proud also when I think about the CEO council, we have uh, uh, a very own hotel uh, alum, hotel alum, uh, Jeff Broadhurst, uh, who's a part of the, he's the president and CEO of Eaton Park Hospitality Group. And uh, he's been uh, just an incredible supporter, uh, a personal friend uh, ever since Cornell. In fact, his father was very much a, a sponsor for me in my career. Uh, and, and Jeff uh, and his family, they continue to support. So I, I just want to uh, give uh, Jeff, I know his brother Mark is also a uh, alum, um, really important family. Uh, and it's great to have uh, the hotel school represented as a part of, uh, as a part of the tally. So I, I do just want to just, just make sure people understand uh, the importance of what we're trying to do um, with, as we build out the Institute, our primary focus will be to educate, develop, connect, and position African American uh, African Americans for executive advancement. And so that's really what our goal and our vision is through the institute. And it goes back to this idea: we don't just want to talk about it; we want to we want to demonstrate success. Let me just share a couple of lessons learned, and then uh, I'll, I'll stop at that point. Uh, first is, uh, it's important to understand the difference between uh, equality and equity. And there's a, a model, some of you may have seen this before, but I uh, always thought it was a, a really great model just in, in uh, really illustrating in a very visual way the difference. You know, of course, on the left-hand side, you know, everyone's treated equally. They all get their own, everyone gets one block. But it's not working out so well for that guy in the purple there, the, the short guy. Even with the one block, that's not really helping him. So the, is that is that really giving him what he needs? Whereas on the right-hand side, um, it shows that everyone has the opportunity to be at the table. Everyone can see the game here, you know. And uh, it just that's a model of equity where people can all be at the table and, and have uh, the opportunity to uh, be engaged at the same time. So I, I, I wish I could say it was my uh, drawing, but it, it is not. Uh, I've seen it out there and, and we borrowed it for this presentation. Uh, but I, 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 every time I see it, uh, it, it sends a powerful message uh, because often we think equality, uh, that's fair, but really it's about equity. And so when we think about diversity, equity and inclusion, uh, the equity play piece is very important. Second is mentorship versus sponsorship. We talked about that. I just shared a little bit about that. Um, and, and mentorship is really important. I always believe you need to have a team of mentors, people in your life uh, that um, can support you and be mentors for you. But in order to really elevate, you also need sponsorship because uh, when you're not in the room, who's speaking up for you? You know, who's an advocate? You know, so on the one hand, mentorship is important, uh, but it's also um, it's also extraordinarily important to be able to have sponsors if you want to be able to advance. And the higher you go in organizations, this idea of sponsorship uh, becomes ever more critical. Uh, then we talk about the effects of institutional racism, right? And so, um, you know, Racism, uh, you know, the, the effects of racism are felt, uh, and you could see them in statistics, you could see them in how people feel, you could see, you could tell that it's out there because if people don't feel that they, they're connected, they, they don't feel they're given the same opportunities, uh, and then you look at the statistics, you could feel the effect of it. What's, what's important to understand, though, is racism uh, is not usually about good and bad people. I think people mistake that all the time. They're, they're, you know, I don't think anyone ever thinks that uh, they're ever being racist, right? And so it's very, it really is not about good and bad people. And it's, it's much more complex than that. And since it's invisible, it becomes even more challenging uh, because people can't see it on the surface, but it's there and it's impacting us. And it's just important to look at it in, in a more broad way. And then, of course, we have uh, the social justice movement. I know um, last year, as we 
Um, you know, there are a number of differences that we can um, see that are tangible, be, kind of pre and post um, uh, the social justice movement that kicked off with the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor uh, in the past year. Um, but that was just, uh, really believe those were just the things that tipped the scale. It's been there. Uh, but, but what was amazing is prior to, you know, this movement of last summer when there's a broad kind of awakening of really, you know, the, the challenges that we're facing as it relates to kind of racial discrimination. Um, prior to that, in organizations, you really couldn't even mention the R word. It was really strange, right? You know, it's, you know, in fact, even as we were building Tally, you know, we're very careful to talk about bias and implicit bias. And, but, you know, as soon as you start talking about racism, people kind of pull back. And uh, that was just kind of where we were as a society. Post uh, the, the um, social unrest and the, um, the social justice movement that kicked off last year, it was almost the opposite. In fact, uh, you know, if you were talking to organizations and individuals and you're saying, yeah, you know, the implicit bias and we got to really, you know, then you're, you know, people are saying, you mean racism. They want to talk about institutional racism. So, so there's some progress there because you really can't change something unless there's dialogue about it and people are willing to talk about it and figure out what can we do to, to uh, uh, create a greater um, environment for diversity, equity, inclusion for everyone. And uh, uh, so that's, if there's uh, anything that uh, was positive from, from the justice movement, the awareness has been um, uh, enhanced to a significant degree. Uh, the other lesson is uh, just the importance of organizational culture. Um, the reality is, you know, uh, there are a lot of great things you can support outside organization, which is important that organizations need that to be able to advance the work they're doing. But the reality is, in order to have really permanent change, and especially as we talk about, you know, creating diverse leadership, there has to be a culture change within organizations. So organizations have to have to be able to take that the steps needed. And of course, that's top down. You've got to start with the leadership to be able to help set the environment and, and really create the expectation and reinforce those expectations uh, to make sure that uh, 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 organizations not only diverse, but inclusive. And those two things are different. And, but you need both. You need uh, diversity and inclusiveness in order to, uh, you know, really create uh, the, the success uh, for cultural change that's needed within an organization to sustain diverse leadership uh, throughout. So it's important to remember the culture change. And uh, I always uh, kind of caution folks that, you know, uh, so often uh, inertia pulls us to status quo. And uh, while status quo has its place, the reality is status quo typically produces the continuation of racial inequity and discrimination in most circumstances. And so to punt and decide not to deal with it, what often you're doing is you're basically saying, we're, we're, we're not going to do anything to advance racial uh, inequity. Um, we're not really that interested in, in uh, dealing with this topic. And uh, I mean, that's the net effect of it. It's, it, it, it's, it's something that status quo uh, unless you are the example, you're most likely um, in a place where you're going to perpetuate uh, racial inequity that exists within organizations. And that brings me to the last point, which is the importance of deliberate action. So it's one thing to say, yes, we're, we believe in diversity and inclusion, but Everyone says they believe in diversity and inclusion to some level and to some extent. It's really about the actions, what, what deliberate actions are being taken so that advancements can be made. What messages are we sending in our organization? What message are we sending to our peers if we're not taking tangible steps? And going back to status quo, without, ten, without tangible steps, regardless of rhetoric, you know, uh, we're, 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 we're at a standstill and we're going to perpetuate uh, the past 
um, challenges that we faced. And so the importance of deliberate action, um, I believe that NSMH was a step in deliberate action for the hospitality industry, uh, just as the Advanced Leadership uh, Institute uh, is uh, taking very deliberate steps to really create actions uh, and, and, and desired results. So that being said, uh, I just want to say uh, what a joy and honor it is to have this opportunity to share with you today. Uh, sometimes uh, a difficult message, uh, sometimes, but always an important method, and particularly right now, um, in order for us to be competitive uh, as individuals, competitive as a society and as our organizations, we have to deal with this diversity, equity, inclusion issue. And I love the theme for for uh, uh, HPC this year together uh, because that, that is the only way that we're going to be able to make the progress that's, that's desperately needed. Um, we have to do it together. So with that being said, uh, I will uh, – up here and open up for questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mr. Frazier. Um, if we could all just give him kind of a round of applause, such an amazing presentation. We have some of our students in the auditorium that you can see here. If you just want to give him a wave um, to Mr. Frazier, but we're going to open it up. We have some pre-submitted questions from our students in Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series. So our first one is from Serena Singerman. She uh -huh. is a freshman and her question is, what is the relationship, in your opinion, between having a diverse corporation and a successful one, especially in hospitality? How do the two coincide? Great. No, it's a great question. So um, um, diverse and successful companies, I believe, are together. I mean, if you think about the makeup of, uh, you know, our society as a whole, um, you think about the makeup of the industry, how can you be successful if you're not moving towards diversity and inclusion within your organization? You're dealing with the public. And the reality is, you know, if people don't see themselves represented in the organization, if they don't feel treated in a, in the, in, in, in a valued fashion, in a fashion, um, then they're not going to feel uh, like they should be paid, you know, patronize your, your organization. Right. And so, I believe it's uh, it's really blending it together. It's it's uh, if you think about um, you know even when I make decisions, you know uh, you know I, I can I uh, often use the example that you know how committed you know can I be if I feel that my organization is not you know embracing me and and diverse people, uh, other people that uh, you know uh, like myself, right? So in order to build employee commitment in order to, to build customer loyalty, um, you have to demonstrate that, you know, this is important. You know, uh, you heard the statistic earlier that talked about um, uh, new uh, employ you know, employees who, uh, one of the things they look for, more than half, one of the biggest things that they look for is, is this a diverse and inclusive organization? And so how can you be competitive uh, if this is not at the forefront? And so, um, uh, that, that's probably the best way I can, uh, start by answering the question. Um, but, uh, certainly, uh, it's, it's a great question and one we need to continue to, uh, to ask ourselves and, and, and really share the importance that to be a successful company in today's society and the future, uh, more than half the new entrants to the workforce are going to be people of color, you know? Uh, and so, uh, how can you be successful going forward and competitive? if you don't embrace this idea of diversity, equity, inclusion. So sorry about that. Our next question is from Paul Lee, a sophomore, and he asks, when starting NSMH, did you ever envision the impact it would have that it does today? And how did your Cornell education help supplement this key component of diversity? Yeah, no, that's great. So it's funny. I'm I'm one of those eternal optimists. So I'm I'm always looking down the road like 20 years, you know. And so I could I could envision NSMH even when we started becoming a lot larger. Um, although it's one thing to envision it in your head, it's another thing to actually see it happen. And to me, every step along the way um, was just affirmation. Uh, and and uh, what what's amazing to me. 
is that uh, you know you said you know uh, it's one you know it's one thing to say oh, yeah twenty five years from now you know we're going to be you know continue to do things and uh, you know it's been thirty two years and it's still moving ahead and I see future promise I, I can think of a number of things um, that NSMH can still do to help fill the gap and to make progress uh, for people of color. And in the industry and to strengthen companies and to strengthen uh, our industry. And so I don't think NSMH is done yet. We have a lot more to go, but I'm very proud of what NSMH has done so far. I think it's time to start to revision and think about the future and all the possibilities that can exist um, that NSMH could take advantage of. But it, it, it's, uh, it really, really is amazing uh, to see it come to, come to light and, and, uh, um, I, c- I can't believe it's been 32 years. Do I look that old? Don't, 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 answer, don't answer that question. <laughs> you do not look that old. <laughs> Evan, thank you so much. What an what a amazing presentation. Um, what wonderful ideas you've presented. Uh, and I know we are all uh, excited, energized, thoughtful um, about all of the concepts, the important message of making a difference and moving the needle and, and making our industry stronger as a result of providing this opportunity. So on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for such a, a profound presentation. Well, thank you. It's what an honor and privilege. And uh, really, uh, 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 we want to thank you as the, the dean and for your leadership. You have been uh, incredible. And uh, thank you for having me here. Our, our, our honor. So uh, I am, I'm cognizant of the fact that I think that Austin's got an HEC schedule to stick to and another session might be starting in just a few minutes. Um, but I know uh, it's been a great day for our students to learn from you, to converse with you. And it's a sunny, warm day in Ithaca, so full of hope ahead uh, on many dimensions. So on behalf of all of the faculty and staff and students, thank you so much, Evan, uh, for sharing your expertise and your passion with us. Thank you. Uh, my, my pleasure. My pleasure. Everyone, I, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I hope you are getting out and enjoying this weather. And um, thank you for joining us today. And we will see you all next Friday. Thank you, Caroline, Isha, and Austin. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you, Mr. Fraser, and we look forward to having you on campus soon. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Awesome. Goodbye, everyone. We'll see you next week.
My name is Max Eftel and I'm a sophomore in the hotel school and I'm a programs manager for the program and innovations team. I am so thrilled to announce ENJ Gallo's panel of focusing on family in the future featuring Stephanie Gallo, Dan Vu, George Marsden and Justin Fryer. Enjoy. Good afternoon, everybody, and on behalf of the E&J Gallo Winery, welcome to HEC 96. First off, as a fellow hotel class of 15, it is such an honor to be on the other side of this conference as a moderator for this afternoon's panel. My name is Justin Fryer, and I'm a business development manager for the E&J Gallo Winery. It's an absolute pleasure to be joined today by a stellar group of panelists from the Gallo Winery senior leadership team. On today's panel, we have Stephanie Gallo, chief marketing officer of the Gallo Winery, George Morrison, Vice President of Sales for the Northern Area, and Dan Vu, the Director of Marketing for the world's largest wine brand, Barefoot. There are two overarching themes for this hour-long panel. We will spend the first half of the hour on Gallo's rich history, uh, being the world's largest family-owned winery, our investment in people first, and what that means to the industry as a whole. Secondarily, we will focus on the topic of innovation and how the ENJ Gallo Winery continues to innovate 150 brands in almost nine decades later. That being said, let's get right into it. Gallo was founded by brothers Ernest and Giulio Gallo in 1933. Today, as we enter our 88th year, the company is still run by the Gallo family. Stephanie, can you talk about how the family component has shaped Gallo? Yes, thank you, Justin, for, for hosting this event and, and thank you for inviting us to participate. It's, it's certainly an honor to be here. Uh, in answering your question, I just really love to provide context in terms of the founding of our company, because I think that once people have an appreciation or understanding uh, for the founding of the company, I think this conversation will will, will make a lot of sense for everyone. Um, so with, all, with, all, with, with respect to your time, I just want to tell you a little story. Our company was founded in 1933 by my grandfather, Ernest, and my great uncle, Julio. They were 23 and 24 years, respectively. They had no experience in commercial winemaking. Uh, the only thing that they had was an undying determination to succeed. So they uh, borrowed $5,000 from my great grandmother and they learned to make wine with two pre-prohibition pamphlets that they found in the basement of the Modesto Public Library. And with that, um, our company, that was the founding of our company. And they started with a very simple mission at first, which was survival. Um, it was right after prohibition, they were coming out of the Great Depression. But as the company grew, they had a vision of transforming America from a beer and whiskey drinking nation into a wine drinking culture. And so with that, um, they, began to, they began their quest to democratize wine in the United States. I think that what makes Gallo so unique is not only the founding story and the energy that it presents, but what it makes it unique is really around our corporate values, which really stem from our family's values, which are our founder's values. And it really comes down to um, the following. We're all about integrity, humility, commitment, respect, and innovation and teamwork. And everything that we do as an organization really stems from, it's important to deliver results, but how you deliver the results is, is extremely important. I think the other benefit of being family owned and operated is that because we don't have to answer to shareholders, we constantly manage our business with a long-term perspective. Um, and some of the decisions that we make may not necessarily pay out today, but they'll probably pay out 10 or 20 years from now, and that's okay because we're managing the business for the long-term. Yeah, Seth, that's, that's great. I mean, a couple of the reasons why I joined Gallo, uh, you know, one being the pillars that you mentioned or ones that I aligned with, um, but also, you know, since day one and even at the recruiting conference and, uh, you know, joining the team from Cornell, um, it really felt like I just joined a family. You know, it was a, it's a company, you know, based in wine, but it felt like, to me, a family. Um, additionally, George and Dan, um, what do you feel about the family component of Gallo? And also, how does this translate all the way down to the sales associate level? Great. Well, Dan, I guess I'll go first. Uh, thanks, Justin. Um, I would just pick up on what uh, Stephanie said. Uh, I think family is the defining component of the E&J Gallo Winery. When people ask me, oh, who you work for, what's it like? The first thing I say is, oh, I work for the Gallo family. 
And I've been with the Gallo family for 30 years now. So although my last name doesn't end in Gallo, I can honestly say I feel part of the family. There's a genuine warmth that the family members have and a care and compassion about all the people who work for the winery that is, um, is felt through all levels of the organization. And I think that's really important. Um, I also think, you know, they always say about culture is a sustainable competitive advantage and all companies have a culture, whether by design or by default. The Gallo Winery has a culture that is a family culture based on family values. I know a lot of companies can say that, but I think one of the differentiating factors is uh, sales reps know the Gallo family members. The winery isn't just owned by the family, but it's literally operated by the family. So, you know, when I started 30 years ago, you know, I, I got to meet Ernest Gallo. I got to work with Ernest. You know, I was blessed to be invited to Ernest's home to have dinner with Ernest and then his son, Joe, who was the CEO. And now Ernest is, uh, uh, you know, the, the new CEO. So I think the, the final thing I would just say is having the first generation and the second, and now the third generation is, is running the company and fourth generation is actively involved. All of the Gallo family members started as sales reps. So I think there, it breeds a real respect and an empathetic leadership style, knowing that all the family members started as a rep and were as a DM and worked their way up. So uh, I think it's probably the most important thing about the Gallo Winery is the ongoing family involvement and legacy. Yeah, that's great. I mean, since day one, I think, just to echo your point, um, the exposure to the family, like you said, for me as a sales rep was pretty apparent, you know, planning dinners and recruiting conferences that uh, some of the Gallo family members were going to be a part of senior leadership at a very, uh, you know, very pivotal and, and early part of my career is, was awesome. Um, Dan, any additional comments? Yeah, I'll just weigh in briefly and uh, uh, say that I uh, agree with everything that Stephanie and George said. I'll weigh in a little bit more on the investment side and the long-term thinking, because I think that that has been hugely critical, not just to the current success, but the going forward success. Uh, you know, the, the company has invested tens of millions of dollars into state-of-the-art, world-class uh, winemaking and grape growing facilities. As, as an example, you all might have heard about the news about the various investments we've made acquiring new brands. And of course, me working on Barefoot, I've seen the huge investment that the company has made in this brand in trying to welcome new consumers to wine, thinking not just about the here and now, but about the long-term health. Because we obviously, as a Gallo family, want to be leading from the front and are trying to ensure stability and continuity for the entire wine industry not just, you know, looking out for the day to day and looking out just for ourselves. And I think that's been hugely impactful. And I'm uh, really excited to talk a lot more about some of the specific initiatives that we've undertaken in order to achieve those objectives. Yeah, like you said, investment in, uh, you know, property and winemaking uh, uh, tools, but obviously the investment in people really is, you know, where, where Gallup puts their pillars on. Um, great. I think we'll move into the second question. Uh, this will be for both Stephanie and Dan, and we'll have Stephanie start. Um, in an era where the human connection is the background of our digital life, how does Gallo development promote human connection and what are the challenges in doing so at a company that is this large? Okay. It's, uh, I think it's a very astute question. Um, I think there's pre-COVID and I think that there's, there's during COVID and then after COVID. I would say that pre-COVID, we spent a tremendous amount of time, now that I can reflect on it, around... Um, we're a company that is very, very uh, anchored in relationship building. And relationship building can look like, you know, folks coming out into the marketplace, working with sales reps, meeting with customers. Um, it could look like celebrating micro moments with someone's, um, celebrating someone's promotion or work anniversary or, or baby. Um, I think the benefit of being in the food and wine industry is that wine is the center of, of connections and it helps facilitate connections. Uh, during COVID, I will say that it has been a struggle for me personally. You know, I miss seeing my colleagues. I miss interacting with them. Um, it's not the same, you know. And so uh, during this time, we've often said, let's operate under a tremendous amount of flexibility, empathy, and compassion, knowing that we're all challenged both personally and professionally, and then we're all going to get through this in the other side. 
Um, and I'm excited now that the vaccine's rolling out that we're going to be able to resume the um, cultural moments that we as an organization have benefited from from connecting with each other one on one. Yeah, Stephanie, I think it's important to note the, you know, the pre and then how we adapted during COVID and you yeah. know, kind of getting at the tail end now for sure. You know, when I started, um, you're given mentor mentorship or very early on um, and given really a, a circle of people that are, are you know, in your corner. Right. Um, and that just really grew uh, to an amazing, uh, an amazing length during, during and sort of at the at tail end of COVID, um, you know, people, a network of people willing to help and you know, it was, it was Gallup people there for me. Um, right. So I, I feel that definitely during COVID. Um, Dan, any, uh, any comments? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Stephanie touched really well upon some of the, like high level, like really company wide ways in which we create and maintain connections among them. I think uh, what the, what we've done really well is also empowered some of the teams in order to maintain that connection because obviously on a day-to-day -day basis, the people that you work with the most are going to be the people that you want to maintain and establish those connections with the most. Uh, and part one of that, I think what we found through COVID is obviously challenging each other is a little bit harder. It's a lot easier to be able to have that uh, really tough debate and really have differing points of view shared uh, you know, when you're in the room together. Uh, but we've been able to maintain that uh, because of the great connections that we've had. Um, we have a great lunch culture, at, for example, as a company. And we've actually continued that throughout. So, uh, for example, you know, every week, uh, my team and I, we get together and we have a different uh, lunch theme. Uh, this week is going to be burgers and shakes. Uh, next week is going to be tacos. And it's just a great way for us to maintain some of those connections that we have with each other so that we know that going forward, we have each other's backs and that we can continue to drive the business forward, not just as colleagues, but as family members. Yeah, I mean, I think we can, you know, working for Gallo can really speak about the family culture and the overall culture of Gallo as a whole. Um, but we've also been named Glassdoor's best places to work uh, since 2017. Um, Steph, what do you attribute to the success? <laughs> uh, I, it really comes down to what I call the extended members of our Gallo family, our employees. You know, it's, um, it's, it's, we would never be able to have that recognition if our if our folks just didn't believe in what we were doing, if they didn't believe that ultimately we're here to serve the consumer. Um, and they really create the environment where they can thrive. So, you know, we're very humbled by it. You know, I, I think every year we're waiting, is, are we still going to be able to, to make the list? Every year it gets harder and harder. But um, I really think that it goes back to what I said at the beginning. I think that we have very strong corporate values. I think the corporate values enable us to hold each other accountable, um, to um, operate in a way that is reflective of our corporate values. Um, and, uh, and I think that it translates into a highly engaged workforce. You know, I know that there's many of you who are contemplating, you know, what careers do I go into? What company should I join? And the advice that I often give people is make sure that your personal values align with the company values that you go work for. And I think that we spend a tremendous amount of time in the interviews vetting that out, <laughs> vetting that out. And I think that if you um, vet it out in the beginning, people are able then to, to operate in a way that is true to themselves. And I think that it ultimately reflects in great glass door ratings. Yeah, Steph, that was a, a big thing for me when recruiting. You know, they were looking at your your leadership within yep. school and your community. Uh, do you have the willpower? Do you have the grit? Um, but with most companies, do you have the culture fit? And like I said, from day one, meeting the recruiters, um, and I was I was blessed to meet Briston Davis and yep. uh, Alyssa Esper pretty early on, and they just made me feel so welcome. And even, you know, all the way to the recruiting conference, I felt like I had known these people that I was interviewing right. with. You know, I just met them the day prior, but I felt like I had known them for, for weeks or for years. Yep. So, George, kind of touching on, on people, working under you and your region, um, it's definitely apparent to me how much you value your people. Um, I think, you know, you're, you're big on culture and it's, it's really apparent to everyone that works under you. Um, how do you specifically invest in your people and why do you think this is important? Well, that's great. Well, thank you for saying that, Justin. I, Stephanie, I hope you don't mind me saying this because one of the values is humility and you were one of the most humble people I know. But if I could, we talk about family values and a lot of people talk, but I think, you know, actions are more important. If I could just share a couple things with everyone, 
that I'm really proud of about the Gallo family is look, you know, the last year has been incredibly difficult and the industry has been ravaged, especially the on-premise industry over the last year. And, you know, the, the family made a decision. We didn't furlough anyone. We kept everyone on the payroll, everybody in on-premise, uh, you know, all of the bonuses and everything was honored in full, recognizing the challenging time and the uncertainty that everybody was facing. But not only that, we had made, you know, over 50 job offers. We've honored every single job offer in the Northern area. Um, we believe your word is your bond. And if you make a commitment, you honor it. And even though we didn't have the jobs, everybody on campus that we made offers to, uh, we've honored every commitment. The internship program, um, and I give this credit to Alyssa Esber, who uh, a Cornell grad, who was the recruiter at the time. She came to me when a lot of companies were canceling internship programs. We had 27 people. She and Ryan Fox had came and said, we don't want to cancel it. We just want to adjust it. And we did a virtual internship program uh, for everyone. So everybody that wanted to have a virtual program, we did that. But it wasn't just about Gallo employees or our new hires or our interns. Uh, it was also within our community. And I'll tell you, you know, one of the things that the winery did was they adopted this program called Roar, Rescue Our Amazing Restaurants. Every employee at the winery every week got to expense up to $150 ordering meals from local restaurants to give them to people in need. So I can tell you, we spent over a million dollars in the northern area, sending meals to frontline workers, to teachers, to uh, to fire, you know, houses, police departments, um, the elderly. One of the, you know, everybody has a picture that they remember, and I'll tell you a picture that I remember. There was uh, one woman; her name was Amanda in Philadelphia. You know, Justin. She sent me a picture of her and her, you know, uh, young son loading meals that she picked up to delivering to elderly in Philadelphia who were afraid to leave their home. So I just think those are things that are really important. I get a little emotional when I recount them, but specifically to the Northern area, I would just say to everybody out there to echo what Stephanie said, look, who the first company you decide to work for, and hopefully it's the only company is one of the most important decisions you'll make. And the most important thing about people is investing time to identify and attract the top talent, to train and develop that talent, to promote and retain that talent, and a belief that we're going to put the best person in every job and have them do what they do best, treat them with respect, support them, empower them, acknowledge and reward. So I would just say winning with people is the foundation of, of our culture, uh, and it served us really well, and I know it's going to continue moving forward because of leaders like Stephanie. You know, George, it's funny. One of um, one of the things that I learned during COVID is that when there's a section of the business that gets shuttered, <laughs> like in, in California, it was the tasting rooms. There were other aspects of our business that exploded, like e-commerce, like, believe it or not, the call center. Um, and, or, you know, we, we, ended up making hand sanitizers. And so, you know, we made a commitment that we weren't going to lay anyone off because there were other aspects of our business that needed help. And so we created a surge program where we were able to um, have our employees that worked in hospitality or in the tasting rooms uh, pivot to other aspects of the business um, to help out. And you know what, it's something that I want to take after COVID because people loved the program. They learned another aspect of the business um, they were able to develop new skills that were actually kind of transferable that they were then able to bring back um, to the business, so um, to their respective business. And some of them ended up, you know, completely pivoting their careers. So, you know, I think that, you know, in COVID, putting your employees first, I think they'll surpri things surprise you. And I think that you can be innovative in ways that you can help take care of your, your employees during uncertain times. Yeah, I think that's the real amazing thing about Gallo is that you, we could talk for over an hour about Gallo's give back uh, during COVID um, as a sort of a great transition to our, our last question for this topic. But just first, just to touch on George's point, I mean, you know, last month I just joined the winery a few months back and we had the pleasure of very, very early on supporting a restaurant in Pittsburgh um, that since the start of the pandemic on their own dime 
has been creating and cooking meals every single day for restaurant workers in the greater Pittsburgh area um, that weren't available to feed their families uh, on their own dime. So we were able to support that with Roar. And that was like really touching to me coming from the on-premise background, just to see that on-premise being, you know, a small sliver of Gal's overall business, but how much really we gave back to that industry is just really incredible. So just to kind of end this, this topic a little bit, we've talked about um, how COVID kind of impacted Gallo. Um, and this is going to be for all three panelists, but um, you know, generally speaking, how do we think COVID has impacted the beverage industry? And then what have you learned from the, from the pandemic itself? And we'll start with you, Stephanie. Oh, I thought you were going to start with George. We can start with George. Let's start with George. Let's start oh, with right, George. You got yeah, it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, two things. Let me start with the second part of the question. How has it, you know, impacted us? You, people may be wondering, if, what is this virtual background? And there are two rhinos. And uh, the reason is, is when we had a, a virtual meeting, I was just thinking, I said, you know what? Our theme for 2020 really is better together. And that's what I've learned is although we were separated, the power of making connections and being purposeful about making sure that we do connect and check in on each other uh, has been a powerful theme about we are better together. And as Steph said, that's something that's going to carry on. We learned so much from COVID that is going to now be the new normal that we can build on and carry on. And I think that's the same thing from business. So quickly, for those of you interested, look, there was a massive shift between retail and on sale. So, you know, on-premise business, unfortunately, in many cities, 20, 30 percent of the restaurants, hotels, on-premise accounts have closed down. They're no longer with us. Hopefully some will reopen. Uh, but look, a lot of them are not there anymore. And, you know, on-premise business, depending on which market and what company, was down anywhere from 50 to 70 percent. Last March, April, May, it was down 90 percent. So on-premise was dramatically impacted and hurt really badly. However, retail had the best year ever. So retail sales, if you look at it, wines were up in the high teens in volume. Spirits were up 20 plus percent. And if you look at categories, one seltzer continued to explode, was up a couple hundred percent. Uh, sweet wines exploded, was up 99 percent. So a lot of new consumers came into the wine category looking for sweet, affordable, you know, easy entry wines. Three liters, that whole premium three liter box category uh, absolutely exploded up over 40%. Uh, a general theme was at least in March, April, May, consumers gravitated to big national trusted brands. It wasn't just in the wine industry like Barefoot. We had our best year ever. Uh, big brands like Barefoot and Carlo Rossi and New Amsterdam and Apothic all had incredible years. But you also saw that with Campbell Soup and Kraft Macaroni and Cheese. It was Americans wanted some sense of comfort, some sense of normalcy. And luckily for the Gallo Winery, we have the biggest, most trusted brands uh, in the industry. So they flocked. Uh, I think some other things digital e-commerce, and you guys know it and you've seen it, but I think it's particularly instructive. It was growing at 400%. And when you talk to people like at Drizzly or Vivino, people that we work closely with in this space, they said the um, adoption model that we thought would have taken five or 10 years was done in months in terms of all of these new people. And the interesting thing is, is about 70% of all of those new people that started ordering alcoholic beverages online are continuing to do so. And the majority have said that that may become their primary way. So I think we learned whenever there is chaos and uncertainty, there's opportunity and it's an idea for new ideas, for innovation to step to the forefront. It accelerates people changing habits and whole new businesses are born. And I would just end with, you even look like a company like Drizzly that was acquired by Uber. Now you're gonna have an alcohol beverage delivery service on pretty much every mobile device in America. How that is so game changing. So I could go on and on, but it's a really exciting dynamic time to be in this industry. Yes, yeah, Steph, would you like to go next? So, um, uh, 
I think that when I reflect on on what has happened is that, and George touched on this, is that never in my professional career uh, has consumer behavior shifted overnight. And I think for marketers or folks that are in sales, um, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I think that being able to pivot to capitalize on those opportunities has has been essential. And I think that what I've learned during COVID is never underestimate the ingenuity and entrepreneurial experience, um, the entrepreneurial know-how of of your employees. I, I think about you know, just a couple things, whether it is uh, meeting the needs from your community to transition a spirits line into making hand sanitizer. Okay, think about that. We, we were not in the hand sanitizer business and we figured that out in a week. Um, it can look like helping our on-premise partners meet the needs of an emerging channel to go. All of a sudden to go, as you know, Justin, to go all of a sudden happened. Um, it can look at new ways to communicate with consumers. You know, Dan did a program with Barefoot and Black Eyed Peas where the Black Eyed Peas came to us and said, look, concerts aren't happening, but you guys have a national footprint. Let's do an AR experience where we can bring the, the concert inside the four walls of the home. It can look at product innovation, package innovation. So I think that, you know, with an innovative spirit and your corporate value of innovation, we're going to keep going and we're going to pivot and we're going to find ways to meet unmet needs. And I think that's what I've learned during COVID is that uh, consumer behavior shifts overnight and you have to adapt and respond and be flexible enough to meet the changing needs of your consumers from a consumption standpoint, as well as from a shopping standpoint as well. Yeah. And just from my perspective as well, Steph, when I was, um, you know, when COVID first hit, I was a district manager in North Jersey and uh, me and my team, we, we shifted our entire efforts and we started making social media posts yep. and talking with buyers about how to get them, you know, a lot of these places didn't even have social media. So we were, you know, taking on these new roles as sort of tech people um, to help them sign up on Instagram and Facebook and create content and something that I've never done before. And it was, uh, you know, eye opening, like you said, and really a shift overnight. So you just explained why I have some followers from New Jersey Liquor that I didn't know how they, okay, so this all explains it. They're now on social. Go. Okay. Yeah. That makes- we were doing, you know, we were doing tastings live and uh, Saw that. <laughs> um, we have an e-commerce in New Jersey who's still doing tasting Tuesdays. And it's, you know, we've seen this industry completely just shift over um, in this world over to the, to the digital and, aspect. You know, I want to say that too. You know, one of the things that I think will happen after COVID is that, you know, coming out to California and experience our tasting rooms, our tasting rooms were very much a hospitality driven model. Come out to California, come meet the winemaker. Um, And what COVID has taught us is that you can democratize the wine tasting experience and actually invite the winemaker to come to your home and give consumers access to winemakers in in a way that they've never had access before. So I think that's here to stay uh, post COVID. Yeah, agreed. And Dan, can you just touch on quickly, uh, you know, some insight on how your business was affected with Barefoot during COVID, maybe some learnings um, and, you know, what you really took away from, you know, a a year of a pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Stephanie uh, used a word that uh, I love, which is democratization. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, the wine category did become more democratized in 2020. Uh, We knew going into last year, um, the wine category is not seen as particularly inclusive, is not seen as particularly diverse. You know, four out of five wine wine consumers are white, and most of those are affluent, highly educated suburban living. Uh, but last year, we saw a lot of new people discovering the magic of wine and the community that can be built around wine. So, for example, um, Latino uh, wine consumption was up 15%. Uh, consumption among black wine consumers was up 12%. Uh, co- consumption among younger consumers, you know, uh, LDA, Gen Z, as well as millennial, up 10%. Uh, and they all joined because of the magic that wine can do in bringing people together. And Stephanie also referenced that, you know, the Black Eyed Peas program that we had, you know, we also brought this community of people together to make an impact. Uh, 
For Barefoot, we helped to raise uh, nearly half a million dollars for an organization called CORE, which is a children of restaurant employees. And we were able to do that by partnering with celebrities like the Black Eyed Peas, like Jimmy Kimmel, uh, like Josh Gad and the cast of Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And they did that because they believed in this. And they also recognized the opportunity that wine brings to bring people together and to give back. Uh, and so they rallied their audiences around that too. So we were really proud to create that community, not just around wine, but around wine and giving back to those who were affected the most. Yeah, great. Thanks, Dan. I mean, I think we'll touch on this a little bit later, but one thing that I always take away from um, Steph's weekly lives that she does with the company is, uh, you know, the ability to act with flexibility, empathy, compassion, and respect. And I think that those four words really just played into this entire past year. Um, so sort of switching gears a little bit, we talked about this a little bit with how we uh, had to kind of change as a company in, in 2020, um, but bring us into the second theme for today, which is innovation. So one of Gallo's company values is innovation. It is defined on the website as placing great value on big things, challenging the conventional ways of doing things and never being satisfied. Steph, we'll start with you. What does this initiative of innovation look like to you? Uh, it is such a layered question. I think that what innovation means is just, as you articulated, con constantly uh, challenging the status quo and I look at innovation, at least from the commercial side of the business in four ways. What are you driving? What are you doing to drive packaging innovation? So wine usually is sold in a 750 bottle, you know, a 1.5 liter bottle. But what we do know is that one of the primary reasons why consumers don't come into the category is that it's not in a single serve. So what can we do to uh, constantly challenge ourselves to make wine more accessible? The second is around product. This is something that we're very, very passionate about. Um, you, I think that out of all wineries, we are very aggressive in really challenging ourselves in terms of how do we make, make wine more accessible from, from a product standpoint. Um, I think, you know, Dan launched Barefoot Fruit Scottos, obviously, you know, the high noon hard seltzer is something that was, um, was a product innovation. Uh, what can you do from a marketing innovation standpoint? You know, are there innovative ways that you can partner with, um, with what I like to call an, an obvious partnerships? Um, is there, can you embrace new technology to communicate to consumers? And then finally go to market. Um, you know, I talked about, you know, is it through e-commerce? Is it through a partnership with Drizzly? Is it pivoting um, to embrace new channels like uh, to go? So for me, I'm constantly asking ourselves, you know, what can we do to innovate in around those four pillars? Yeah, I think you nailed it, Steph, with, uh, you know, the, the aggressiveness um, and the push forward that Gallo really has. I mean, I've never seen a beverage company that's purchased land and created yeah. brands and made lasting partnerships, like you said, really faster than any company I've seen in this industry. Um, and with over 150 brands, Gallo has obviously been innovating from the start, like I said, creating, buying up, uh, creating these partnerships. Dan, can you speak to a little bit about the process of marketing um, such a diverse portfolio of brands and how you innovate to reach a diverse set of consumers? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as we've talked about earlier, uh, the Gallo Winery is about welcoming and winning new friends for wine. That is democratizing the wine category. Uh, and that's making sure that, as Stephanie said, we have a really diverse portfolio of wines, not just for different people, but also different tastes and different occasions. Um, so we see that we have a huge opportunity in the under $11 wine category. Uh, we have research that says that uh, most consumers who are new to the wine category, who are being welcomed to the wine category, enter into that under $11 space. So that's something that we place a huge emphasis on. Uh, but also on top of that, it's also making sure that we have great packaging innovation so that we can meet consumers' needs in different occasions. So it's not just about having a wine in a bottle, but it's about having wine in a can or in a tetra pack or in a box or any and all sorts of different packaging formats because really the way people are thinking about wines and enjoying wines are very different uh, and we want to make sure that we're meeting consumers where they are and giving them opportunities to enjoy our products and then lastly of course uh, as you said, we have a huge diverse portfolio of brands and we want to make sure that we're meeting all sorts of different consumer tastes and styles through those brands, whether it's a certain style of wine, whether it's wine coming from a certain region, wines for a certain price point or for a certain occasion. We want to make sure that we have something for everyone because the wine category is so diverse and it is so awesome. We want to make sure that we are innovating in that way to make sure that we are achieving all sorts of different occasions to meet consumer needs. 
Yeah, I think one one stat that always blows me away is that uh, you know one in every three bottles of wine um, in America on a, on a dinner table is a Gallo product. Um, you know, these people are really coming to our brands. They trust our brands. They trust our process, and they're really looking for our family of brands to introduce them to uh, you know new categories and new and new wine brands. So this next question um, is sort of a loaded question and covers the impact of innovation on all levels. This will be for Steph and Dan, and, and Dan, we'll start with you. Um, how does innovation created at Gallo penetrate the beverage industry, and how does Gallo create a space to allow for a generation of new ideas? Yeah, um, I'll speak uh, first and foremost on the DNI front. Um, I am proud to be leading the diversity and inclusion team for Barefoot, which uh, is the first DNI brand team of its kind in the wine industry. Um, and so uh, we recognize that you know. 84% of the growth of the U.S. has come from multicultural consumers over the last 10 years. And of course, that number will continue to grow as we think to the next 10 years. So it's not just imperative for us to be, you know, thinking about diverse consumers, uh, but it's also imperative for the wine industry to make sure that we are welcoming new and diverse consumers to the category. Uh, and the ways in which we do that is in a lot of different ways, you know, specifically on Barefoot, I can speak to some programming around our Latino consumers. So making sure that we have Spanish language communications on uh, channels and networks that Latino consumers are. So we have a big Telemundo advertising campaign. We have a very easy path to purchase with a Spanish language website and where to buy in Spanish. Uh, on top of that, we also do a lot of outreach and specific communication to the black community. We recognize that uh, black consumers in, you know, in our conversations with, with black consumers say, hey, look, we love wine. We don't feel like the wine industry loves us back. So we have a lot of great programs to support entrepreneurship through Barefoot, through a partnership we have with the New Voices Foundation. Uh, and last but not least, we also have our wonderful LGBTQ plus community, uh, which we've been a proud ally of for over 30 years on Barefoot. Uh, just last year, we launched our Pride Bubbly Bottles, uh, which we not only launched in May and sold through June, but we also brought to the largest stage in the world, which is to New Year's Eve in Times Square to make sure that we were standing loud and proud with the LGBTQ plus community throughout the year. Uh, and as a quick sneak preview, uh, this year we are coming back with the next iteration of our LGBTQ plus bottles. And we are speaking specifically to the trans community. So we have a trans flag design on our bottles with proceeds of that going to NCT, which is the National Center for Transgender Equality. That's really awesome. I, I wasn't aware of that. And that's such a great initiative. I think just the industry in general, it's really, you know, it's a tough industry to break into and it's a topic that is not really understood by most people. And it's, in my opinion, not accessible uh, for people to understand because, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of brands, a lot of wines and, and beverages make it hard for people to understand what they're consuming and where it comes from. And I think one of my missions, uh, you know, falling in love with wine was to make it more accessible uh, to others. And I think a lot of our brands, you know, all of our brands really do that as well. And they, and they, they do really well. Um, Steph, any, any comments to add? No, I, you know, I know that what your question originally, Dan did an awesome job, but, you know, I think getting back to your original question, how do you create space for new ideas? I often say this to the team here. Um, you know, we're all about winning new friends for our wine. We think that there's a tremendous opportunity and it's very important for me as an organization that our organization reflects what America is like today and what America is going to look like tomorrow. And so in order to truly innovate to meet the needs of what I'm calling the next generation of wine consumers, it's really important for us to create an environment of that, that diverse talent feels welcomed um, and creating an environment where folks are, are feel comfortable to be their authentic self. So, you know, I think that to drive an innovative environment or to drive an innovative culture, you need to have, um, an employee base that is reflective of, of what the consumer looks like today and what the consumer is going to look like tomorrow. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, even talking to my own experience, I, uh, my, my fellow boss in New Jersey went on to work for the winery in, uh, in the luxury innovation team. And at this, at this time, you know, I was a district manager for a couple months and he reached out to me and a, and a colleague and said, Hey, we're on the innovation team. You know, you're in the streets, you're talking to buyers. Um, we have, you know, we have a summit coming up. We'd love to hear from, you know, what you and your colleagues think are the next big things in wine or, or in beverages. So we really got to like sort of pitch our ideas to uh, our fellow right. boss and he, you know, he really them up the ladder. So probably you and, and the you know, Gallo yeah. senior leadership Josie. team and Josie. Yeah, Josie. Josie. Yeah. And it was really great that once again, I'm a, I know I'm a year and a half, two years into my career and my ideas and what I think will be the next big topic are being really filtered up, which was awesome. 
Um, and George, I'll kind of kick this over to you a little bit. Um, how do you think Gala will continue to innovate? And you know, can you give us a sneak peek of what's on the horizon? Sure. Uh, I think two things. Uh, you know, it was funny when we were discussing this before. You said, "Hey, what do you hope to see in innovation?" And um, my response to that would be: With innovation, the first and most important thing is attitude. Uh, you have to have an open mind. And rather than saying, "What am I hoping?" I think it's for me. It's more: What do I believe is going to happen? And the confidence that I have, one with Stephanie and her team, with the dedicated innovation iHub. That, that they have to bring forth ideas. I think uh, two is the lines of communication. Literally before this call, uh, Ernest Gallo, who's our CEO, had sent me up and said, hey, George, let me know what's going on out there. What are the hottest trends, hottest topics? What are you seeing in market and hearing from your people that I can't read on an IRI report? So the fact that the company at all levels is asking our sales reps or we're asking our customers, we're asking our consumers, you know, what do they want? What's going on? Uh, I think is, is really important. And you know what? I would just say an example of the company's commitment to it. Uh, many of you out there probably have read the book, uh, Creative Confidence by David Kelly. If you haven't, I, I highly recommend it. But we were blessed in that our leadership team uh, actually went out um, and did a creative confidence workshop in San Francisco. Um, and it was just amazing. And just one thing I would just share quickly is that I like they said, you know, when if you ask a four year old, can you sing or are you a good artist? And the answer is yes. You know, I've got a young daughter who jumps up on a table and sings into a microphone screaming, doesn't think twice. It's like, dad, watch me, watch me. And yet, if you were to ask me, can I sing, which I can't, but the answer would be an automatic no. Or can you draw? Are you an artist? No. And yet my daughter brings home pictures every day from school that she's so excited about and proud of. So I would just say to you about innovation, and it's not my idea, it was David Kelly's, is how do you get back to that four-year-old you that wanted to sing, that wanted to dance, that wanted to draw and not be afraid of failure. And I think that's one of the great things that Stephanie and the family has done is nobody likes to fail and we don't want to fail too often, but failure is part of the innovative process. So once you get comfortable with failure and then learning from that failure, um, that's when big ideas come. And the last thing I would just say is this on it, is we had a theme uh, of how do we ignite the spirit of innovation and tried to drive that with every person that, look, it's all of us. You got to have a spirit of innovation. And then how do we create an eternal flame of innovation? And what I found over the last five years that we're trying to do it is a lot of people have a lot of ideas and the inspiration is everywhere, but you need to have a process to funnel those ideas because if you're someone that keeps giving great ideas and you never hear back or nothing gets acted on, it just goes into a black hole, that kills an innovative spirit of an organization. So I think what, what the winery has done really well is we've tried to highlight future leaders, future ideas, and elevate them. So I know, Stephanie, you're very excited when we send you ideas and we, we have a structured process. So at any rate, uh, I would just say innovation is the key to our present and our future. We live in a, in, a, in a creative culture. And that's why it's so important to attract the best and the brightest creative people who are excited by ideas and want to share and bring those ideas to life. Yeah, George, you uh, just said one thing that I just wrote down in my notes over here, ignite the flame which I love whenever I hear you speak about, uh, you know, the future of the company, innovation, leadership, you ignite the flame in me. I mean, I'm, you know, if this wasn't a COVID world, I'd be outside right now. I would, I would leave this chat and run out to a couple of accounts and start selling something because you, you've ignited the flame, which is awesome. Um, and I think that's a, a great transition into our last question for Steph. So Steph, you lead off our weekly CMO live sessions. You, you know, they're created to really inform and inspire every Monday. And you ask us, like I said before, to operate with, flexibility, empathy, compassion, and respect. Can you speak to how that motivates and drives you and the company as a whole, um, including from the perspective of diversity? And then do you have any uh, lasting words of wisdom for the, the students here? Justin, I love the question because I know that we're short on time. Um, you know, we, 
the CMO Live for the company town hall that's become what it has become on Monday started as a response from COVID. I think that when you have everyone working from home, I just invited the company to join this call. And, you know, our theme was really around empathy, compassion, flexibility, and respect. And I think that in order to truly be innovative, you really have to be empathetic to the consumer. You have to be compassionate to your colleagues and you have to be flexible, you know, willing to change your point of view or your hypothesis with new information, I think is absolutely critical. As I mentioned before, um, attracting a diverse workforce is, is one of my personal priorities because I don't know how we're going to be able to grow this company and the industry quite candidly, if we do not have extended members of the Gallo family that reflect what our consumer base is going to be. So it's something that I'm, that I'm very passionate about and, and we have a long way to go within our industry. And I don't think that there's any other winery or alcohol beverage company that's going to be com committed to it like we are. And advice for people that want to join our industry or our company, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I, I, I love talking to people about what a career can look like. Um, and if you're passionate about food and wine, that's great. If you're passionate about um, innovation um, in the alcohol beverage space, we're excited to talk to you. So um, you don't have to understand or appreciate wine to join our company. We can help invest and train you in that. Uh, but what you can't train is on grit, creativity, and um, and, and innovation. Yes, yeah, Steph, I think you nailed it. Um, George or Dan, any yeah. any lasting words? For the if students? I could, and please to everybody in the audience, forgive me. I am in sales. Uh, I want to use this opportunity to sell a little bit. First, if you guys notice Stephanie's virtual background, uh, that's our brand new uh, Louis Martini winery tasting room. It is spectacular. So in the spirit of come see us, come get to know us when safe to travel, please come to Napa and come see us uh, at not only our Martini tasting room, but we've got tasting rooms all over the state of California. So come see us when safe and when able. Two is we're going to come see you. We will be on your campus. We're on your campus a lot. And when we, you know, now that we, we've been limited virtually, we're continuing to set up events, but we're going to come see you on campus. Please seek us out, get to know us. We want to get to know you. Uh, I also want to say thank you that literally we have 17 Cornell grads working in my area, the Northern area, almost over 15% of our entire team in the Northern area is Cornell grads and it only took one and we got one Cornell grad and it was such a great experience. And that one Cornell grad went back on campus and then we had two, three and literally, I know Stephanie takes this. You don't mind me sharing Stephanie personally, our number one recruited school by far is Notre Dame. We have Notre Dame people running all over the Northern area. And Stephanie went to Notre Dame, Joe. Including the leprechaun, including the leprechaun. The leprechaun, we have the leprechaun. I think we have two of them. So <laughs> the bottom line is, is there's an opportunity, Cornell. Right now, you're one of our top three highest performing schools. I think you guys could be number one. Our recruiting team was number one on Cornell last year. And like I said, please get to know us. Thank you for all the Cornell grads that have joined us. And the last thing I would just say to you guys is this about your career. All of you guys are so talented. I'll never forget when I, I went to Harvard and my freshman year, my first day there, they said to me, I know what you're all thinking. And, the, and they're like, what is that? It's that uh, you're the mistake. Um, and they said the Harvard admissions doesn't make mistakes. And I bet you the Cornell admissions would say the same thing. Everybody in this audience, you guys are there at Cornell because of accomplishment and because of success. Uh, and you have an incredible future. My only advice would be go on an adventure. Don't think of it as a job or even a career. Life's too short. Think of it as an adventure and think about a company that's going to invest in you, provide for you opportunities, uh, that's going to enable you to grow, to reach your full potential professionally and personally. And I'd love to get to know you guys that are interested in learning more about us. So thank you very much. Thanks, George. Uh, Dan, any uh, few words for the, the students in the audience? 
it's horrible going after George, Dan. That's why you yeah. have to do it. Yeah, I, and, and we're, we're short on time. I'll just say that um, hopefully what you heard from us today is um, where we are going as an organization as, and as a company, and that we value every single voice that's a part of this family. Um, so for those of you who are interested in the industry, please do, I will sell like George here, please do take a strong look at us, uh, not just because we're a great place to work and it's a great place to be a part of the family, but because we need you. We need smart, driven, young voices who can really represent the next generation of our consumer base. Uh, and we will need your voice to be heard in order for us to be successful, not just for Gallo, not just for wine, but for the entire industry. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, just to wrap this up, first off, I just wanted to thank the amazing panelists for their time and contribution to discuss today's two themes of family and innovation. Uh, Stephanie, George, Dan, uh, your insights on the industry, Gallo innovation have been you know, inspiring to me and, and very educational. So thank you, uh, first and foremost. Um, next, I'd like to thank all the participants and students in this room for giving us the hour to showcase the ENJ Gallo Winery and what we're about. Um, if anyone, like George said, I'm also going to take a minute to sell. If anyone is interested in learning about Gallo, please reach out to the HEC team. You can find me, Stephanie, the panelist on LinkedIn. Um, please reach out. We'd love to get in touch with you and, and discuss Gallo uh, in greater detail. And then lastly, great job. You did a great thanks. job moderating. I'm proud of you. Thank you. And, and lastly, uh, thank you to all the students who make HEC happen year after year. After the past year we've had, I couldn't think of a better theme for HEC 96, which is togetherness. Uh, thank you for including us in this year's program. We hope to see you all in person at the Statler very soon. Cheers.
Hi, my name is Dana and I'm the Assistant Programs Director for Programs and Innovations. It is my honor to introduce World Finer Foods, Food Trends Through COVID and Beyond, featuring Susan Guerin, Pepper Bynum, and Yuna Chung. Enjoy. Hello, I'm Susan Guerin with World Finer Foods. Um, we're excited to be here today to tell you about what's happening in the food industry, particularly at retail uh, and uh, different types of retail shopping channels um, during COVID and beyond COVID. First, I'd like to introduce myself, uh, the CEO here for World Finer Foods. I've been here about eight years in a hotel as well. Next, I'd like to introduce Pepper Bynum, Pepper has been with us about eight years. Um, and while not a Cornell Hotelie, she actually was in marketing at Wyndham Worldwide and has a real appreciation for the industry. She's our marketing director here on a number of our brands. And finally, uh, Yuna Chung will be speaking with us also today. Yuna was our summer intern last summer and will be joining us, we're thrilled, full time after graduation this year. And so she's a uh, joining in in the presentation, having done a lot of work here over the past six months. So with that, we'll turn to the next chart. So a little about first World Finer Foods. Um, World Finer Foods is a company where we own our own brands. We have about 12 of our own brands and we manage brands for other third parties around the world. Our goal is to build the brands through all channels, whether they be at grocery, natural like Whole Foods, uh, club stores like Costco, uh, convenience stores, food service, uh, e-com, or many other channels. And so um, we're domestic in that we only, we for the most part, only sell brands in the US. We do a little bit in Canada, but our brands come from all over the world and our goal is to grow them. Some of our largest brands, just to give you a sense, are Bon Maman, which uh, is the jam with the gingham lid that looks like grandma wrote on it. A lot of you probably have it in your pantry. Um, we also have a lot of beverage brands like Belvoir Fruit Farms. We also have ethnic brands like Kitchens of India, um, Tai Ling, uh, Chinese um, food. We also do a lot in the plant-based sector. We have our new brand, Good Catch, which is a frozen plant-based gluten-free wrap. We also launched Good Catch, which is a fish-free tuna, which is now going around the globe. And we also have in the food service things like International Collection, their pro line, as well as in domestic, uh, in retail channels, La Perouche, Raw Cut Sugar. So we span a lot of different categories. Um, and the idea is that all the products are premium, um, they're higher quality, and they have a lot of uh, positive attributes, whether they be organic or non-GMO um, or keto, and we'll talk about a lot of those trends as we go through um, the presentation. The key is that we uh, get to develop what hopefully you get to eat tomorrow. So with that, we'll go to the next chart. So we're going to first start and talk a little bit about COVID and what's happened during COVID at, at retail mostly, um, but it obviously affects food service as well. As we all know, when March and April started, there was a lot of panic buying and pantry loading, just like you're having a snowstorm or a hurricane. And people were rushing to the stores and they were buying whatever they could find, particularly paper goods and plastic, things like that but the basics and um, the shelves got wiped out pretty quickly. During the next stage, people started to say, okay, now what am I gonna do if I can't go out to eat? The restaurants are now closed. And so kind of becoming, not yet becoming creative and trying to avoid going to the supermarket as much as they could. And so that was kind of a weird phase where people were sort of not knowing what to do yet. 
But then the next phase got more interesting. We saw a lot more things happen, uh, which probably started around June, July time, where people started to really experiment with cooking at home. People were now working from home. They need, the kids were home and they needed a lot more meals. They were starting to try things. They were ordering meal kits, a lot more online shopping, uh, some ordering out at that point by then. Um, and so what we found is a lot of people became much more confident in their cooking abilities. Um, where before, it was really putting things together that were kind of pre-made. And so we started to see a lot of our products do exceptionally well. So for instance, with Tai Ling, we saw a lot of people wanting to experiment with ethnic and Asian flavors, and those brands did exceptionally well during that period as people tried to make every day a little more interesting and exciting for their family as they were looking for that change. Um, and now, what do we see? We see people are kind of used to cooking more than they used to. Um, and that really has really changed, I think, how people are going to view it. Um, is cooking easy or difficult, and how much time do they want to spend on it? But from where we were before, it is a little more part of our normal life, as we all start to return to a more normal place where people are starting to get the vaccines, we're getting more open dining and people starting to return a little bit to more of the normal. So um, what did we find during this period in terms of brands? So clearly a lot of disruption of brand loyalty. And that was largely because what people wanted to buy maybe wasn't there and they had to just grab what was there. So it forced more trial and thus more switching. Um, what we found, sorry, <laughs> what we found was in some of our brands, we brought in a lot of new consumers into the brand because we ensured we had product and supply. We worked very hard at that. And we had actually a lot of new consumers try our brands. As a result, we'll keep some of those consumers They've replaced what they've bought before, and hopefully we continue to uh, create, retain these consumers and create future loyal consumers. Um, but the key during this phase was, can we actually provide you with product? Because the shopping trips were really short. I don't know how many of you remember that, but all you want to do is get into the supermarket and get out of the supermarket, grab your stuff and go, and not spend any longer than you had to into the supermarket. And so those, those shorter shopping trips really resulted in sort of taking what was available. And also price, not much of an issue. And that's something we've seen over time is that, shockingly, um, our consumers today aren't very price sensitive in the premium space. And honestly, they just wanted what they wanted to get in and get out. And so price, um, promotions, things like that really weren't a big issue. So. During these things, there were some trends that we've talked about, which, were, which we still think people will come back to, you know, whether it be about corporate responsibility, what are we doing to the environment, and are we transparent? But people weren't spending time during COVID reading labels in store. Okay. So what do we think is going to happen um, in 2021? in terms of um, at home versus out of home. So we talk about mobility. You know, this was actually, this uh, survey was done a little while ago. And interesting, I think we've moved on a lot from then. Um, you know, I think we're moving faster with the vaccines. There was a lot of issue about the availability of the vaccines. And were we going to return to our normal patterns? Um, and how fast would we? Um, I think we all have different views about the fast. I think the optimistic scenario on this chart is the most likely one, where people will return um, faster than we thought. And then by July, I think we'll see a lot. And it also coincides with the ability for people to eat outside. Um, so restaurants will benefit from that as well. So. One of the other things that I think will change these trends as we go past COVID and beyond is, is really about working and where people are working, whether they're working from home or not. And so one of the things we think about 
is which occasion, breakfast particularly, will still stay at home more than it ever was before. Because one of the things that we don't believe will change back to the way it was is we think more and more people will work from home because we've all learned how to use our technology to allow us to do that and for people to work remotely. So we believe that there'll be more breakfast consumed at home and possibly more lunch. Dinner, we think, will go back to real work. So with that, what I'd like to do right now is turn over to Pepper and Yuna to talk much more about the food trends and the consumer trends that we're going to see, what we had and what's here to stay. So Yuna, I'm gonna turn over to you. Thank you, Susan. So yeah, the circle diagram kind of helps us to see what specific product attributes as well as shopping expectations consumers have had in mind from COVID and even how it carry on today. So if we look on towards the right side of the circle or the left side of the circle with the white, um, price is one of the top priorities. So with job difficulties as well as stimulus checks coming in, financial implications of the pandemic have been very tangible, which has led to consumers having budget as their main priority. And moving on to taste, a lot of consumers have been going back to their tried and true brands, but as Susan has mentioned, have also explored new brands. But in response to that, manufacturers and brands have been postponing or canceling innovation flavors, which we'll also be discussing a little bit later. And as we mentioned before, the pandemic has brought out the inner chef in many of us. And while this is an exciting change, it could also be daunting. So a lot of consumers have been looking for convenience meal options. The pandemic also heightened the focus on holistic health and well-being. So product search attributes relating to immunity or stress and anxiety management have actually increased. And consumers have now have these three priorities on safety, value, and convenience. So as a result, it's really important for brands to have this omni-channel presence. So beyond the brick and mortar to be able to have e-commerce as well. And what's been interesting is seeing how consumers are now more aware of their social impact in terms of purchases. So we see here that consumers are 55% more likely to purchase environmentally friendly products. So they're having more awareness of these certifications or these different claims. And lastly, with the pandemic changing how we meet people or how we're eating, um, a lot of consumers are looking to bring the out of home experience in home. So with that said, the next slide will show us these nine food trends that we've seen in 2020 that will continue through 2021. So the first is related with convenience with the idea of prepared meals or meal kits. And the second relates to the idea of the increased consumption at home. Snacking has definitely increased, but consumers are also looking for healthier alternatives such as better for you snacks. In relation to the product search attributes, consumers are also looking for products with added functional benefits. But there are also consumers who are looking to change to more healthier lifestyles, whether that be looking for more plant-based offerings or even trying new diets like the keto diet. And in relation to exploring, experiencing, um, consumers are looking to explore global flavors in their kitchen that they might not have in the past. And they're also recreating restaurant favorites that they're having a little bit hard access to. And in the grocery space, we've been seeing the growth in premium as well as super premium brands. And the last trend we'll be discussing about is the conscious consumer. And now I'll pass on to Pepper to discuss about the meal kits. Great. Thanks so much, Yuna. So meal kits are a really interesting development that have been growing in popularity over time and certainly fueled even more by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So as we look at meal kits, it really offers consumers the opportunity to do a few different things. First is convenience, right? No longer do you have to worry about that meal planning that everybody dreads during their weekly shopping trip, which changed a lot during the pandemic as well. Inspiration, right? Global flavors, new experiences from a flavor profile standpoint, things that we would normally not pick off the shelf to, to explore. We have the opportunity to do so here. Culinary adventures. Um, unfortunately, a lot of us haven't been able to go out to restaurants during this time. And the good thing is that we bring some of those similar restaurant experiences into our own homes. So exotic flavors, convenience, all of those things help to make the meal kit business really strong during this time. Interestingly enough, we saw um, more 
expansion in some of the better for you options like Sun Basket and Purple Carrot that focus on either organic or plant-based diets. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Snacking. We love to snack in the United States. We like snacks as meal replacements. And during this point in time with COVID, three in five Americans chose better for you snacks more than they would have prior to the pandemic. So we're all very health conscious. We wanna make sure we're taking care of ourselves. And that's a really good thing. So what we saw as far as an implication in market is we saw a lot of big CPG brands change their strategy and pick up a lot more natural, clean ingredient brands. So a few examples, Mars bought Kind, the Ferrara Group and Eat Natural. So all of these changes that we saw in snacking um, were really, a it was a continuation of what we saw prior to the pandemic, but really fueled and accelerated by it. So 37% of people saw snacks as a COVID-19 related food strategy, right? Of, uh, 26% of eating occasions ended up being snacking occasions. Now we'll talk a little bit about some innovation that we saw and how companies adapted and brands adapted to this changing environment. So again, going back to healthy foods, during the pandemic, everybody was looking to take better care of themselves. And we saw about 65% of shoppers adhering to particular diet or health related eating programs, whether that be keto, um, low carb, other diets, um, certainly lower sugar is a trend that we've seen progressing and certainly accelerating during the pandemic as well. Um, another thing that fueled that is in 2020, we actually had some labeling changes uh, across the industry where added sugars were now called out on nutrition facts panels on labels. So it was again, an acceleration of something that was already heading in that direction. We also saw that plant-based meat alternatives, another better for you option, really started to, um, to accelerate. So there were meat shortages that we experienced during the earlier part of the pandemic when there was uh, some COVID-19 outbreaks in meat packing plants. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on which company you worked for, you might have benefited from that if, if you were at Impossible or Beyond Meats or some of the other plant-based meat alternative brands um, that were really prevalent and gaining popularity during this time. In fact, some, some really great food service items started cropping up at Burger King. Who would have thought that Burger King um, would actually launch the Impossible Chris Sandwich? Unbelievable. But the interesting news about this is this is, a, a, again, a trend that accelerated during the pandemic, and 30% of those new buyers in that category returned and purchased again. So this is definitely something we see as a trend that will remain. As we look at the reasons behind why consumers choose plant-based foods, there's definitely a few different themes that arise. First is to improve their health. There is a perception that if it's plant-based, it's better for you. Certainly being environmentally responsible is, is a really key driver of this as well. Addressing dietary needs. Obviously things like plant-based foods, you don't have to worry about any allergies to eggs and other things. Um, making sure also that the, the growth in this area also ensures that consumers have choices that help them to feel good about their contributions to the environment today. So we saw some developments in a few different areas over the course of the past year. We definitely have seen more fish, pork, and, and seafood replacement products. Um, some alternatives that have hit both in the retail space as well as in the food service space. And as a result of the traction that plant-based foods have been getting, we are definitely seeing a reduction in price and an increased availability across retail and food service. The other interesting development is food technology is really gaining traction. So a couple different companies emerged um, over this course of time and have been developing over the course of the past several years that we find really intriguing. First is Perfect Day Foods. 
So this is an animal-free dairy company brand that uses um, fermentation in order to develop their dairy-free alternatives. So the benefits of that, a few different things, no lactose, hormones, antibiotics. It is a, definitely a better for you option, better for the environment and animal friendly. Blue Nalu and Shiok Meats. Again, some fantastic food technology here too. They're using cellular agriculture, which is really lab grown fish. So I don't know if everybody here remembers the term frankenfood. It was used in response to um, GMO ingredients, genetically modified ingredients. And uh, one could suggest that this lab grown fish from Blue Nalu could be of the same ilk. But the good news again is that um, no animals were harmed in the making of these products. So they have a really interesting proprietary um, way of going about this where they take living fish tissue, they place it into a culture media to grow, and they then they assemble that into a frozen or fresh seafood product. So again, wonderful message as it relates to sustainability, um, supporting the ocean and ecosystem health, human and animal welfare, and, and um, really doing the right thing for the environment so that we ensure that we're in good shape for our futures. And finally, just eggs. This is an interesting one to me as well. So eggs are the most consumed animal protein in the world. And Just Eggs uses mung beans to replicate the texture and taste of eggs. Um, so zero cholesterol, allergy-free. It's one of the, eggs can be one of the main allergens out there. And um, it's a fantastic product that really does replicate the taste and flavor and gives you a wonderful experience and saves a chicken or two. So with that said, I'm going to turn it back over to Yuna. Thanks, Pepper. So as we talked about earlier, keto is a rising trend and it's actually one of America's favorite diets. For those who aren't familiar with keto. Um, it is a high fat and low carb diet, but we've also seen that consumers are changing that to adapt to their needs. So there's actually a ketotarian diet, which is more of a plant-based spin. But either way, products with the words keto in their names have actually seen over 70% increase in their year-over-year -year sales. So given that this market is projected to reach more than $50 million by 2027, there are some implications that we can look forward to. So the first being that there could be a growing selection of plant-based, but also high protein foods. And the second being that there would be an increased assortment of sweet keto treats. As we see here below, we have everything ranging from a cookie to even keto yogurt. So the possibilities really seem endless. And moving on to the next slide, we also see that consumers are definitely trying different flavors and becoming more adventurous in the kitchen. You may or may not recognize or even have these in your pantry today. Um, but some of the ones I wanted to highlight were the Piri Piri Instacart sauce, Lao Gan Ma, which is a spicy chili oil, and QP Mayo. These products have seen big gains in year-over-year -year sales from more than 100, even 200%. But one in five in Americans are looking for ways to enhance the taste and texture of their meals through these exotic spices and flavors. And as Susan mentioned earlier, that earlier in the pandemic, consumers were pantry loading. And so it's interesting to see that one of the two cult favorite pantry staples were anchovies as well as fancy foodie approved mayonnaise. Moving on to the next slide, um, we mentioned a little bit earlier that innovation has been refocused to meet the demands of current shoppers while also giving the opportunity for brands to be built and fostered for the post COVID-19 environment. So the first priority is to simplify the product line. So Oreo is a classic example here. We all know of their endless flavors, but Mondelez actually responded during COVID by postponing and even canceling some innovation flavors. But they're not the only ones doing that. PepsiCo also cut about 21% of their Frito-Lay SKUs. And this in turn also helps shoppers and relieves them of that decision fatigue. So in terms of simplifying the product line, it's important to maximize the production of high demand products while cutting assortment based on incrementality and velocity. And the second priority is to invest in research and development and target these unmet segment needs. So Chobani is a great example of a product that emerged out of the financial crisis. And it was actually the premium breakfast solution as it targeted that on the go market that we couldn't have seen earlier. So in that same way, COVID has really laid the foundation and the opportunity for brands to 
increase usage among existing buyers and convert new buyers as well. So more than ever, it's important to maintain commitment to innovation research, concept development, and commercialization. And for this post-recession environment that we are about to see, it's important to target value to your needs and affordable luxuries. And related on that note of luxuries, we've actually seen a growth in premium and super premium products that even consumers of low-income households have shifted to these super premium brands. Um, some examples include Rao's homemade tomato sauce and even Lindt's Lindor chocolates. But what's interesting to note is that these relevant attributes that mark premium focus on anything from health and wellness, immunity, to indulgence and convenience. So we see here an example of Amy's. They're marketed as a natural and better for you brand. While we have haagen which is encouraging consumers to indulge, but with less of a guilt with fewer calories. So these new product launches in 2020 have reflected this new premium positioning. And the last trend we'll be talking about is how to adapt to embrace the needs of this new conscious consumer. So today's consumers demand more corporate social responsibility than ever before. They're more knowledgeable of different types of claims, what goes into their products, and so on and so forth. So they're more conscious of food waste and ways to reduce their carbon footprint. So you've seen that they've responded in this way by eating more plant-based or plant-blended meats, or even purchasing sustainably packaged products. As we see here in this chart, these are some top sustainability claims, but they're centered around plant-based ingredients, recycled packaging, or even B corporations, which is an example of a sustainable certification. But in that same way, consumers are being more aware and more are increasingly getting more information on these ethical and humane claims. And now I'll be passing on to Pepper to talk more about the performance and evolution of channels during COVID. Great, thanks, Yuna. So looking at our experience during COVID and what shifted during this period from a channel standpoint, we saw that there were some clear winners and losers during this time. So winners included e-commerce for sure. We probably accelerated e-commerce between three and five years during this course of time alone. Um, grocery channel definitely won. Again, we talked about those pandemic stockouts that happened left and right at the beginning of the pandemic. Club stores buying in bulk, fewer, fewer trips, bigger baskets, and certainly dollar stores as well. Those have been the key winners during this period of time. Convenience struggled, obviously not as many people traveling, picking up you know, a couple of items on their way to work, taking a trip and grabbing something along the way. So that certainly struggled and drug um, was, was about flat. So as we look at in a little bit more depth, some of the different channels, one we haven't talked about yet really is food service. So there are definitely some things in food service that we think um, some trends as far as the offerings that will continue over the course of time. So what we saw during the pandemic is an increase in family size and bulk options from different uh, restaurants. So we do think that that will continue over time, but not, not as much as, uh, as we would like in certain cases. Um, we would look to see more indulgence and items on menus that um, enable us to treat ourselves and more healthy, better for you menu items at the same time with a 56% effective rating. And then multi-day meal options, not as much of a winner um, for here, but moving forward um, could be effective, but it's not gonna continue for the long term. So as we look at the grocery environment, in particular, the online grocery environment, we saw that there are some clear winners here too. So Amazon, uh, grocery actually accounted for 44% of all consumer packaged goods e-commerce sales, which is amazing. Um, our food and beverage business grew immensely in that channel over this course of time, 125% in 2020, um, also driven by click and collect programs. So things like um, different intermediaries like Instacart, for example, $15.7 billion over that course of time. Looking at Walmart, we have the Walmart and Kroger.com business. So brick and mortars have been certainly employing an omni-channel strategy and getting more and more heavily focused on e-commerce. And that has paid off for them over the course of the past year in particular, and it will continue. So looking at 2021, 
we're anticipating that online packaged F&B sales could range from 94 to $109 billion. So again, that acceleration in this channel has, has really just taken off immensely, more, much more than anybody would have anticipated pre-pandemic. Top players, um, again, these are the key players that we see, but a lot of other brick and mortar businesses have gotten involved in e-commerce solutions as well. And again, it will continue to grow. So some consumers we anticipate are gonna start returning back to the store and we're seeing more footfall in stores. Um, but some of those purchase behaviors, that convenience of having an online order delivered right to your door, that could continue for many consumers. And certainly we're gonna anticipate, and we're already seeing that more of these national players, the larger grocery chains that are brick and mortar focused or had been, are adapting their route to market and really employing different strategies like click and collect and partnerships with Instacart and other intermediaries. So speaking of the battle between click and collect and home delivery, um, home delivery we saw up 61%. Obviously some challenges to that, porch theft, the cost of delivery. Um, we don't have it here, but I think also packaging um, in certain cases could be an issue from a sustainability standpoint and limited flexibility availability, especially early on in the pandemic. Click and collect was up 105%. You know, wonderful speed and convenience. It, it was a lot more accessible during different points of the pandemic. Cost savings for the consumers or the, for the shoppers and then limited time and exposure in store. Certainly everybody was looking to get in and get out or not get in at all and just have everything available to them at curbside pickup as well. And so, you know, we saw some changes in strategy as well as it relates to dark stores and pickup lockers. Amazon is, is a key uh, driver of this, whereby you have your order ready and you can go and pick it up at your convenience, limited exposure, and uh, certainly very, very easy to execute. But we do still believe some consumers are going to continue to prefer shopping in person. Thinking about, you know, going to the grocery store and picking out produce for yourself, for example, or some fresh foods, other meats and things like that. There are a lot of consumers who believe that, you know, they'd much rather have their hands on items and do some browsing and shopping to see what items they might want to explore and bring into their homes. So what we need to do moving forward is to make sure retailers need to make sure that they are really connecting with consumers and making that store experience an enjoyable one for them. Um, certainly a lot of adaptation to the retail environment to make it more COVID friendly making sure that antibacterial wipes were available, et cetera, social distancing, one-way aisles. We saw all of those things happen during the pandemic. But these retailers also need to ensure that they are um, building a connection with consumers because they could very easily lose their business to e-commerce. And then the last is from a brand standpoint, what we need to do as brands is to make sure that we are curating meaningful interactions with the product and the consumer. How do we build that relationship with the consumer to ensure that he or she will come back to our products and ensure that they, they will choose a branded product and not a private label product, um, making sure that we have all of the right ingredients, so to speak, to continue that relationship. So a few stats here quickly to touch on. Um, I, I was mentioning earlier, 33% like to view, touch, and interact with physical products. 26% of shoppers enjoy the shopping experience, and about 13% like the immediacy of an in-store shop, that what in-store shopping provides. So again, I think it kind of runs the gamut, but e-commerce is definitely here to stay, and I think it will retain a lot of consumers in that channel. So with that said, I will turn it back over to Susan to talk about the response to shifting consumer behavior. Great. Thank you, Pepper. And for those of you who want to bring some questions in, we'll, we'll take some questions, so feel free to put them in the chat for us and, and, and we'll, we'll answer as many questions as we can. So just to sum up a little bit, so with the pandemic, as we said, there were fewer SKUs, less variety, um, as the retailers were trying to keep their shelf stocks and all the manufacturers tried to focus on supply and then and, and having fewer items made it easier to do that. 
So, the, so that then brought a lot of other questions up, is really how many choices do this, the consumer need? But then you kind of go around and you say, well, in the end, we need innovation. And variety is important. And what we're seeing right now is a real opening up of the ability to present new items and retailers being more open this year to looking at new items. And so we think by the time you get to mid-year, you'll see again more, more choice, more options, and more newness coming. I think one of the interesting things is someone like Costco. Um, because of the lack of the demonstrations there where you can't go around and try everything, um, newer, more specialty items aren't actually performing well at Costco right now. And they've focused their efforts right now on the core bigger brands. And again, once that comes back where they can, where you can go around trying items, I think we'll see more innovation there as well. One of the other areas that uh, we want to talk about next is private label. And um, we did see, due to availability, private label did emerge as a winner during the pandemic. And while the U.S. is still way behind Europe in its rate of private label, we can really see it growing. Um, one, private labels coming out with better products. Um, Target just announced this week their new favorite day indulgent line. Um, so there's definitely um, you know, more upscaling in private label um, and more natural items and things like that. So the branded people like us really have to innovate and we have to come up with things that really win the consumer over because the competition is getting fiercer and fiercer. And people sometimes view private label brands like Trader Joe's as premium to branded products. So we really have our work cut out for us. So now I'd just like to sort of conclude and, and, and get some questions uh, from running, which is, what do we think this is going to look like? What's our conclusion? So we believe that Brands that win will retain their new customers that they've gotten during the pandemic and continue to capitalize on that growth. Online food, we're putting all of our resource around e-com. Um, we see the acceleration and we continue to drive that across, whether it be Amazon and different parts, Seller Central, Vendor Central, the pure play e-com retailers like iHerb, like others, whether it be the brick and mortars and their dot coms, or even our own direct-to-consumer e-com platforms. All four are really important, and we believe will continue to be the, um, mo the highest growth area um, in the coming year or two. Again, the trends we talked about, maybe they're a little on a hiatus, but they're going to reemerge. Consumer habits uh, have a long-term trend, and we're going to see these reemerge and grow. And food tech, really interesting. Um, that's accelerating, and we're going to see more and more um, over the next year or two as, it start, as some of these brands start to actually be able to commercialize and come to market. And then finally, and I think actually most importantly from both a food service and from a retail perspective, is what are the implications of work from home as we have more and more work from home, and what will that do in terms of the in-home versus the out-of-home food consumption? Um, and that one, we believe, is very important to watch. Um, and we're excited in a sense for breakfast. Um, so with that, I want to open it to questions. Um, we have a question from Rachel. Has World Finer Foods changed your added products due to COVID? And or what kinds of brands are you looking to move towards in the future based upon these trends? So I'm going to let Pepper answer about the what kind of products have we changed or added? And I'll talk about the future trends. Thanks, Susan. So, you know, as, as we mentioned earlier, launching products during COVID was a very difficult beat. We actually were in the midst of launching our Cool Beans um, vegan wraps during that time. So that's certainly something, again, plant-based um, meal alternatives. I mean, this is certainly something that's really hot right now and will continue. So we're anticipating really big things from that brand and hopefully you'll see it in a campus uh, location near you um, it, coming up in the near future. Um, but other things we're, we're looking at again, really 
touching on some of the trends that we talked about, plant-based. Um, we have something underway, which I can't really talk about, but some exciting news will be underway, which I'm sure we'll get to share um, with you at a future date. Um, some new brand launches that we're looking to do. And then really playing off of some of those unique flavor profiles that we're seeing be successful, really bold flavor profiles, um, some things with Asian flair, certainly um, making sure that we are um, allowing consumers to take that culinary journey with us. Great. Thanks, Pepper. And I do think we'll also see, you know, the premium nature will continue. I believe that we'll see a continued experimenting by our consumers. Um, and so, you know, I believe that we'll see more Franken food, to be honest, as we like to say. Um, I do think there's going to be really, we were looking at something the other day, it was actually 3D printed food. So um, it's, it's unbelievable what's happening. But for today, I think the, um, the, the more interesting flavor profiles, the plant-based, the organic, the healthy, um, those are the things that are going to win. Um, and so that's where our focus is. Um, we had another question from Meg Hillback. Is there any research on people using more essential oils in their foods? And so I'm going to answer this maybe a little differently, is that what we see is a real interest in food doing good for your body. So I'll call it like a nutraceutical, um, which we're looking into how do you actually have food make you healthier and what can you do with that? I'd almost say there's some views, you know, we have a CBD beverage, um, Mood 33. That's been really hard to sell during pandemic, um, and the laws are unclear on that. Um, but I do think we're going to, people do like the idea of their food doing good for their body, and I think we'll see that um, start to um, drive and, and to see more innovation there. So... Um, so with that, I think we're at time. We're actually over time. I want to thank you all very much and look forward to seeing you tonight at the mocktail reception. Um, but thanks for joining us this afternoon and uh, have a good break. On behalf of the Student Board of Directors and Student Managers, thank you so much for joining us for the 96th Annual Hotel Ezra Cornell. We are so appreciative of your participation and attendance in this year's conference, and I hope you've taken away lessons, connections, and memories that will truly last beyond this two-day span. While we may be physically apart, our connections bring us closer together. May HEC 96 be a reminder of the power of togetherness despite any challenges along the way. In addition to our wonderful attendees, I would also like to acknowledge the individuals behind the conference. I am so appreciative to be part of this amazing conference and continue on the tradition, and it truly would not be possible without all of you. First, to our amazing assistant directors, managers, and designers. Your dedication both to HEC and the hospitality industry is incredible. You all truly encapsulate the spirit of togetherness. Second, to my amazing board of directors. Every single one of you truly exemplify what it means to be a hotelie, and each of your dedication to HEC is inspiring. I can assure every attendee that the future of hospitality is bright. HEC has survived through a depression, a war, and now officially a pandemic. With every opportunity presented, we as hotelies have the power to innovate and persist, overcoming challenges and defeat with grace and generosity. I hope this year's conference has provided you a refreshed sense of hope and tenacity, not just now, but forever. Thank you all so much for joining us for AGC 96, and we cannot wait to see you next year for AGC 97.